Hey, it's Hugh Hewitt, and when I want to know what's going on with the Cavs, the Browns, and the Tribe, I tune into Sports Fix. Hey guys, J-Rock here from the Sports Fix, and we always talk about using our platform to try to help the world and the society we live in, and everywhere I go and everywhere we go, bullying is one of the problems in today's society. There's nothing worse than any person, big or small, strong or weak, adult or child, feeling picked on, pushed around, vulnerable, and victimized at the hands of a bully. Change comes one person at a time, and my good friends at No Such Thing as a Bully are working on skills and techniques and ways that we can all change and make things better for everyone. Find out more at nosuchthingasabully.com. Portions of the Sports Fix brought to you by Harry Buffalo. Catch every UFC pay-per-view live in full HD at Harry Buffalo North Olmstead, just outside Great Northern Mall. Harry Buffalo, join the herd. You are the voice of the Sports Fix. So pick up your phone now and call 216-539-7535. 216-539-7535. Live in Ohio, it's time to get your fix. The Sports Fix. And away we go. Wasn't even sure exactly how exactly how to start this thing. I said, you know what? I'm just gonna turn it on and let it go because uh, yesterday was a tough one, man. Yesterday was a tough, tough. You know what? It wasn't as tough if it hadn't happened 40 previous times. You know, thickened skin becomes hard to crack. But man, oh, yesterday cracked a little bit for the Cleveland Browns, guys. We have got. A ton of things to do as we kick off not just another week, another month. Cracking the month of October open. Flip the top on it here on the Sports Fix. We've got a lot of things to do. Dan Wismar is going to join us, obviously. By the tone of the voice, it's not a uh, it's not a, not a a grand occasion, but we will be talking about the Browns and, and the good, the bad, and the ugly to come out of yesterday's tough, tough loss. Seriously, snatching victory. Or, excuse me, snatching defeat from the jaws of victory. That type of thing yesterday in San Diego when uh, when uh, your offense definitely gave you enough to do what you had to do. And the defense, your de- the defense, man, we're going to get into this. The defense let you down once again. And uh, the most excuse to disappoint. And that, more than anything else, more than the jokes, more than the easy... Uh, Twitter gags and, and lines that people get uh, more than that kind of stuff um, that you hear, you know, that people like the, the, the lowest common denominator kind of things get a cheap pop. That is going to be the biggest uh, mark against Mike, Mike Pettin here as this season continues to roll is that defensive side of the ball. That's his pedigree. That's his specialty. We're going to we're gonna get all into this. Slice this thing open. Carve it down. Your thoughts as well. Going to crack open the phones. As I said, Dan Wismar is here on a Monday afternoon doing the sports fix thing with us. We're talking Browns. We're talking NFL. Indians, three straight winning seasons, technically, as they didn't play 162. They played only 161 this year, but it doesn't matter. They got the extra one on the plus side. First time since 99, 2000, excuse me, 2000, 2001. And uh, Cavaliers scrimmage. There's tons of things. Buckeyes kicked off Big Ten play. All of these things we're going to get into when Dan joins us. Obviously, going to kick it off top of the show, talking some Cleveland Browns. There's a ton to get into. You guys ready to get into it with us? Then let's do the thing. Welcome in, you guys, to the Sports Fix. I'm your host, the Big Daddy on the microphone, J Rock, Jerry Myers, with you here. I'll, I'll tell you what, I promise I'm not going anywhere in the fourth quarter. I'm not caving at the finish, guys. I'm going to be here with you, finishing this thing strong across the Sports Fix radio network. Maybe you're listening live on TuneIn, tunein.com, their digital app, mobile app, however you're doing it. Tune in, one of the best places to listen to the show. Perhaps Perhaps you're enjoying the show live on Spreaker.com, Mixler.com, their respective digital mobile applications. Also fantastic places to catch it live. So if you are listening on digital delay and you go, hey, I'm one of the thousands that listen on instant replay. How can I listen live? Tune in, Spreaker, Mixler, 
all great places to listen to the Sports Fix live each and every day, as is our website, the home base, thesportsfix.net, your one-stop shop for all things Cleveland sports, all the Sports Fix live replays, the show blasts right off there, right on the website, no buttons needed, bookmark it thesportsfix.net as well. Welcome in all of you guys. As I said, thousands who listen around the world 24 hours a day in different cities, states, countries, time zones, zip codes, all over the place, all over the world. On sites like iHeartRadio, the world's largest internet radio provider. On iTunes, on Stitcher Radio, on all the different places that you guys get your fix on digital delay. Thank you guys so much for doing that as well and being here. Every time we get to crack the mic across the sports fix radio network you guys be a part of the broadcast the phones are open 216-539-7535 216-539-7535 the numbers to call facebook twitter email always using the social media stay in touch with us that way facebook.com slash the sports fix or just search for the sports fix there on facebook tweet with us at the Sports Fix CLE email us, the Sports Fix at AOL.com, Facebook.com slash the Sports Fix, Twitter at the Sports Fix CLE email us, the Sports Fix at AOL.com. A couple of things from over the weekend. Got a chance to catch up with Tony Brown, new voice of the Lake Erie Monsters, guys, and he will be picking up in the place of Doug Plagans and joining us here for some regular Monsters conversations. Hopefully, once a week, we're able to sit down with Tony as he gets settled into his new job. I'm looking forward to that one. But I told you guys I was in the process of that, and we've got that taken care of over the weekend. Can't wait to uh, introduce him to you guys here on the airwaves. But I uh, wanted to let you guys know about that. Also, just as I'm kicking off the show, I was going to tell you guys, felt weird this past weekend. No, uh, no high school football. It was the first off weekend I've had since the season started. And uh, it was cool. It was I went off the grid, as I told people this weekend. I went off the grid, had a, had a couple of, and, and did not in any way have any kind of a vacation. So much, uh, so much work being done. Side topic. I'll just tell you now, uh, starting with the Ohio Center for Broadcasting and doing uh, the teaching, teaching uh, the actual act of the instructing. No, no, no problem. I love that. I love the process of teaching people, but uh, uh, the actual course design that the I'll, I'll tell you what uh biting off an elephant piece by piece is the best way i can put it because otherwise you you choke if you try to swallow the whole thing at once uh i'm doing some things that are outside of my comfort zone very much uh outside of my comfort zone here trying to help actually design some sports broadcasting stuff and uh it's it's an adventure that's for sure and i spent a lot of the weekend bunker down working on that in between watching some football and some baseball all weekend long that's going to be uh that's going to be interesting right around the corner that uh, sports broadcasting specific program kicks off over at the ohio center for broadcasting and i will be i will be teaching there full time it's the reason that the Five day a week schedule of the sports fix changed, but anyways, a little bit strange. No football this past weekend, and I have no idea why. But for some reason, I I thought it was going to be two weeks in a row because I'm on the road this weekend wrestling, and I, I cracked open my email, and sure enough, I am back on the air. I totally forgot. Don't know how. So for those of you guys that missed me this past weekend, you can catch me this Friday night live, Madison at Willoughby South. I'll be doing some. Radio baby talking about the uh, the game of the week over there on Integrity Radio for those of you new to the game and for those that tune in every week Madison Willoughby South this week's edition not sure if it's the radio game or if it'll be a, a B broadcast and a website broadcast but you can find out WINTradio.com and I'll tell you guys more about that here later in the week tell you what high school football uh, a lot of times keeps me grounded being able to go back and watch it at its base level especially after stuff like this weekend let's do it let's talk about it you guys as we're talking about the the browns yesterday on the road and I'll, I'll tell you what totally honest was not feeling good i wasn't my son and i were talking before the games and uh, you know we were going over all this you know it's probably a few minutes before the game we're talking just kind of out on the porch enjoying some conversation and i said man You would think three-fifths of the offensive line for the Chargers is out. The Chargers have given up nine sacks in their first couple of games here, and uh, defenses have been able to break through. Defenses have been able to get to Phillip Rivers, which (laughs) – 
Which is Penton said Philip Rivers is hard to sack. I would agree if it wasn't for the fact that the previous teams that agreed. But uh, regardless, that's that's neither here nor there to the point that I'm making. But we started talking about the game, and I said, I said, Jerry, I'm not feeling good about this. He said, Well, how come, Dad? I said, Because the San Diego Chargers have a very good offensive team, first off. I said, look across there. And the first name that I pointed out, he didn't have as big of a game as I thought he was going to have, but he's one of those guys who is the type of receiver that is traditionally a Browns killer. Stevie Johnson. We were talking last week, Keenan Allen and 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 all of that, but Stevie Johnson, he's always been tough against the Browns. He's, uh, to me, he's, he's a good wide receiver out there that's completely overlooked. And uh, anyways, but you had Keenan Allen, Stevie Johnson, Malcolm Floyd, which, by the way, quickly became uh, neither of two of the former of the final two there that I just listed as they went out and got thinned out with injuries. We'll get into that as things got uh, even more injury plagued for the Chargers, going, which which makes what they did at the end of the game speak even more for their team and their coaching staff and Philip Rivers. But Philip Rivers, there was one of the main reasons I said, Jerry, Philip Rivers sometimes doesn't get his just do in my opinion I think he's a great quarterback I think that he uh I think that he's the type of quarterback that will, that finds the soft spots in a defense like the Browns that's full of younger, especially guys in the backfield. And we were talking about if Joe Hayden didn't play and, you know, kind of setting the stage for what was yet to come. And I said right there, I said, plus look at the backfield. You've got Gordon. You've got Woodhead. Woodhead is a dangerous weapon out of there. And, and I know that because I find him any time that I can in fantasy football because he's one of them guys that's going to get a lot of catches. He's going to get a lot of yards. He's all over the place. He's always a a versatile part of a of a team's offense, you know. So and that's just on the offensive side of the ball. I said, now obviously the Browns should be able to get to Phillip Rivers today. This is before the game, looking ahead to what was going to happen, especially with three backup offensive linemen across that Chargers offensive line that had already been weak throughout the uh, the season already. So setting the stage, he said, well, Dad, what do you think of first score? I said, man, I got to tell you, I don't think the Browns offense is going to be able to keep up that's going to be the problem. I said, I think the Browns score, you know, 17 points or so. I said, the problem is, is I think that the Chargers put 30 plus on the other side. And, and that's kind of where I saw the game ending up. And I was very glad to say wrong offensively about what the Browns did. The Browns, and I'm going to say the same thing right now that I said last week. Anybody out there, I don't care who you like, who you don't like, who you want behind center for the Browns or any of that. When the Browns signed Josh McCown, I will point to last week and this week and say, if you are not satisfied with what you're getting there, then you are unsatisfiable because I can name you a dozen places that the Browns lost this game and ain't none of them got nothing to do with anybody that had their hands on the football under the center yesterday. That's all there is to it. Uh, Josh McCown, seriously. And I did not like the signing of Josh McCown at all. Still don't, but he played a hell of a game. He made some throws. He didn't just hit wide open guys. He made throws, a couple of fantastic throws, especially on that big drive to come all the way down and, and uh, get the Browns back into it there. And then they get the two point conversion. He rolled out on one and avoided the sack, stayed alive, and then got the beautiful pass off down the field. That floater over the shoulder to, to Barnage, beautiful, beautiful. I'm just saying. I didn't know Josh McCown could play football like that, man. So I don't expect more. Hell, I don't expect anything better. If if Josh McCown gives you that every week, you won the lottery of Josh McCown. You won. You got the better half of what you paid for. Trust me, there's good and bad in every free agent signing. If you get that guy every week, you won when it comes to Josh McCown. The guy was spectacular. What was his what was his final 32 of 41? I mean, 75% or so of his uh of completion percentage uh, again with the yardage with a just a strong performance and uh to me a fantastic game and having the the running backs involved man not only were the running backs involved in the passing game they were the passing game a lot of it and how about duke johnson seriously you can't just 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 beat down beat down beat down we'll progress to the sad 
sad kick in the gut ending of this thing. But Duke Johnson, there's some there's some hope spots there. There's something to take a look at. He got over the the top of that linebacker. I don't know that I've ever seen a running back catch an over the shoulder rainbow in the corner of the end zone like Duke Johnson did. Great pass, put on the money. Even better uh, uh, reception there by Duke Johnson. Duke Johnson had nine receptions yesterday. Him and Crowell both very effective. As, as far as passes out of the backfield and rushing the ball. I mean, you know, 60, what, 65 yards, 63, something like that for Crowell. But I'm still better than you've gotten out of either one of them so far. Uh, good usage out of the out of the running backs yesterday. And, and a good, I thought, a good offensive game plan overall for the Browns. I mean, they did. They had a, a good flow, a good mix. They offensively did well. And I'm going to just stop with the Josh McCown conversation at if you if you want anything more you're insane you won you won i'm sure it can i know it can only get worse from here because that is absolutely the best Josh McCown you're going to get and he doesn't he does not have anything to do with what happened you wouldn't have won that game if anybody else had played quarterback because this game was lost on the side of the ball it makes me look foolish makes all of anybody who thought or and, and you know what you can make and i i will listen you can make excuses defensively all you want joe hayden played last week by the way he didn't play this week i'll give you that but he did play last week he played every other week uh, they were thinned out defensively you were you were without bryant you're without robinson robert excuse me robertson you're without hayden you were definitely without starters at each of the three levels of defense i will give you that that that's all i will give you that is all that i will give you is that because you still could get no no pressure at all on philip philip rivers jersey was clean from beginning to end what did he get sacked once twice in that game uh, he was able to stay clean against uh, or with an offensive line of three backups on his offensive line keeping him clean that's the, that's the biggest thing he's back there and they were pointing it out on the broadcast on some of those crossing patterns how if he doesn't get four to five seconds to make those passes then it's not happening if he doesn't get the, uh, the opportunity to have that time he can't because these are patterns where they actually have to develop down the field and he was able to get four four and a half five seconds uh, in each one of those uh, opportunities and that enabled him to get the passes off down the field I mean we just could not get any pressure on him defensively and uh, you know I mean I will say that they did a good job keeping I, I will say that they kept the wide receivers in front of them, but you're not gonna you're not gonna stop a quarterback like Philip Rivers when he is unable or when he is able to do what he did yesterday. He was able to, and there were some amazing close ups. If you guys just like the game of football, side note off of the Browns, if you just enjoy the game of football, there were some great uh, audio close ups yesterday of Philip Rivers. But there was a couple that were clear as day where the announcers laid back and you could literally hear him pointing out every player on the defense and literally telling his guys, OK, you got to pick up this guy here. He's coming over here. Watch this guy there. You, you, you know, just like like a mini version of like the, what Peyton Manning does with his type of offense. Philip Rivers is a veteran quarterback. Again, I may hold him in higher esteem than some of you guys do. I think he's a very good quarterback. I would take him on the Browns. And it, this past winter when people were like, hey, would you trade for him? I'm like, yeah, I wouldn't give up a one. But then again, if I knew I could get him for three or four years, maybe I would because I think Philip Rivers – is exactly what you saw yesterday a veteran quarterback a quality quarterback and he was doing that and when you have when you have especially younger defensive backs you've got guys who are also playing out of position which is what the browns had a guy like philip rivers can go to work and that's what he was doing and what makes it even more impressive guys is the fact that and this is more of a nail in the coffin of the browns defense is the fact that not only do you have the offensive line laid out as we talked about but the uh, chargers i believe only dressed four wide receivers to come into the game and they lost two of their top three wide receivers as the game was progressing on as they they lost Malcolm Floyd to the uh to the concussion there as he took a shot right after he caught a pass 
and uh, and then then they also lost uh, Stevie Johnson there for a minute. Hey, who steps up? Uh, Dontrell Inman steps up, and the tight ends step up, and Danny Woodhead steps up, and and Woodhead made some huge plays for them, including a, a really good run there where he broke tackles and got loose. Browns again unable to stop the run on that final drive, but uh, you know uh, that's the thing you can't. You can't use injuries as an excuse in a game like this when the other team was every bit as embattled as you were. And I, was, I will say this. The end result sucked. I mean, this was one of the few. And look, I'm I'm conditioned to Browns losses just like you guys. But this was one at the end where you really did feel kicked in the gut uh, at, at just the way that because it was there couldn't have been a more Browns way for them to lose the game, as we'll we'll talk about here in a minute. But I looked at my son halfway through the third quarter and I said, hey, I said, if you don't have a dog in the fight here, this is actually a good football game that we're watching. It was back and forth. It was a very good football game. Uh, the, both teams played well in the context of just watching a 60-minute football game. And the Browns drive at the end. Again, kudos to Josh McCown, to Barnage, to Hawkins came up. Everybody, uh, Benjamin, a couple of catches there. Everybody stepped up. Duke Johnson, Crowell. Duke, how about Duke Johnson, by the way, picking up some blocks? That is... Uh, combined with his pass catching ability is going to make him the starting running back sooner rather than later. If he continues, he, he picked up some blocks, man. He, how about that one? <laughs> there was a couple of good crack back blocks there, man. But, uh, uh, keep an eye on that. Duke Johnson can block there in the passing game. But anyways, going back to the flow of the game, Browns with a hell of a drive down at the end. And then they get the touchdown. They get the two point conversion and tie the game. Of course, Everybody in Cleveland already knew what was going to happen. This is the God's honest truth. One of my friends, one of my wrestling buddies, I, I laughed. I, I, I didn't see it until the final two plays of the game were happening. But my literally, my friend Matt put on Facebook, see you in about five minutes, Browns, when San Diego kicks the winning field goal. And... I look. I refreshed my news feed, and it was eight minutes later, and they were kicking the winning field goal. And I just showed my phone to my son, and I said, "Look at this. This is so sad because he wrote this eight minutes ago, and here they come." And anyways, the the Chargers get the ball back. How about that? All you had to do. Look, you weren't trying to get the ball back and win the game or anything. I mean, you just make a stop. Make a stop. Just just get this thing to overtime, and then have a crack at seeing how this thing plays out. Instead, boom, 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 dude, right down the, the field they come. Woodhead with that 20-yard run that I was talking about. A couple of big pass receptions. Here they come. Bam. Game-winning field goal. You're thinking, oh, boy. And my son's like, no, Dad. No, Dad, don't get down. See, you know, the boy's only 16, about to turn 17. He doesn't have a – I mean, even though he's got a lifetime of, you know, this generation of Browns, he's not as hardcore about it because they, they've stunk for his whole life, you know. So, I mean, he's not – he's not like me. He grew up when they were good, and then now you're, like, all – deprived and wondering what the hell happened to my football team. But, you know, my son, he's just kind of used to it. But he goes, no, nah, Dad, they, they can miss this. Browns are going to block this one right here, man. You got to have faith. And I'm like, okay, son, let's do it. And, you know, you got to love the youth, keeping you alive, keeping you optimistic. Here we go. Snap, hold, almost blocked. No, nope, the kick is no good. I'm like, well, I'll be a son of a gun. We're going to get some overtime in here. Flag on the field. I mean, how many of you sitting at home felt just like that? Flag on. I mean, you just, you go, you've got to be kidding me. This is against the Browns. You didn't even need to hear anything else. This is against the Browns. They're going to re-kick this ball. You've got to be kidding me. And boom, 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 boom. Game over. Just like that. And here we sit, and you just sat there and said, I can't think of a more Browns way for them to lose this game than what just happened here. I mean, seriously, that was, that was, it was what it was. And to be honest, uh, you, you know, depending on which side of the ball you looked, half of this team didn't deserve to lose. But then again, it's always that way with the Browns. Never, never a double sided effort, except for a few select games of the year. It's always. This side let that side down. That side let this side down. You know, and they all let each other down, by the way, with a dozen penalties. Second time this season that they've had a dozen penalties in a game. I mean, that, those are 
the death knells to me with Mike Pettin. It's not that I don't believe that he can't fire up the troops. I do. It's not that I don't believe that Mike Pettin cannot be an effective head coach because I do in the X's and O's, perhaps, maybe as a defensive. I don't know because he's he's all over the place right now and all the things that are quote-unquote falling through the cracks are all the things that are, are absolutely the most crucial. Having a disciplined football team not committing penalties. Those are the things that fall right back on the coaching staff. A defense that can't stop anybody with a defensive head coach. That is the those. It's not Johnny Manziel. It's not Josh McCown. It's not uh, midget wide receivers. None of those. Dwayne Bow, as miserable as he's been. And how about how about that complete lack of effort? on the one pass attempt to Dwayne Bowe yesterday. That guy has got to go. That one is up right up on the tombstone of Ray Farmer, as far as I'm concerned. That's a miserable signing there. But that doesn't that doesn't go on Mike Pettin. What goes on Mike Pettin is all the penalties. They've, they've got to be leading the league so far in the season or right up there in penalties. What goes against Mike Pettin is the defense giving up. Okay, yesterday. Take that aside. This is a whole season problem a quarter of the way through. Defense has given up 26 points a game. 405 yards per game. And it's not one side of the ball or the other side of the ball. Passing game. They have given up seven touchdowns, no interceptions. They have been carved up by quarterbacks the last three weeks. They've played good quarterbacks, don't get me wrong. The running game. They have been destroyed. They are dead last against the run. They did hold San Diego under 100 yards on the ground, but they were dead last, and I believe they still will be coming out of this week as far as uh, allowing teams to run the football. So, I mean, that is the stuff. And by the way, I mentioned the highest defensive salary in the league. Try $62 million worth. The Browns have $62 million of their salary cap on defense. I mean, those are the things that 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 are going to come back on Mike Pettin. It's got nothing to do with the quarterback because the quarterback has absolutely nothing to do with, with the Browns issues here at all. And I would go so far as to say, you can tell me you don't want to hear it, and I know that we can get to arguing about the experience, and, and at some point that's going to matter as this season continues to uh, roll on towards the later parts of it. But that game doesn't end the way it did yesterday with number two at center. I'm just going to tell you that now. Not a chance in the world. A couple of those, That drive does not get made with that effectively a rookie quarterback under center. That drive is made because, I'm telling you, I mean, say what you will. Josh McCown, he 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 can't win them, but he can play them. He's like over his last nine now. He I don't think he's ever won a game where he's thrown for over three hundred yards, but he can throw them. He just can't win them. It seems like, but you definitely you wouldn't have got that final drive. I would say. And you know what else I find telling? And when I get Dan in on the other side of this, I want to talk about it. What else I find telling? They had three quarterbacks up yesterday. They had Davis, Austin Davis, up for the first time, active on the uh, on the day on the game day roster. How rare is that? The Browns don't like to go three on the roster, let alone three on the game day. And uh, that said something to me too. Said to me that if Josh McCown got injured, it might not even have been Johnny Manziel that went in and, and was the backup there. I'm just saying that was a a bit of an interesting thing there too. Um, Something we'll talk about with Dan when he joins us. But anyways, uh, as you know, all adds up to a 30-27 to defeat for the Browns in a game where offensively they played well enough to win. Offensively, on the road especially, they did what they, uh, what they could do there. But instead, uh, even though you had big games from your quarterback, from several skill position players, the defense gives up 430. And back-to-back -back games, quarterbacks have absolutely had their way. I mean, think about it. Phillip Rivers, I'm going to go back to it one more time. At the end of the day, with the chips down, Phillip Rivers with a backup offensive line, only two active wide receivers remaining. They come in. I don't even think they got to a third down on that final. I could be wrong. Correct me if I'm wrong, guys. But I don't think they even got to a third down on that final drive of the game. It was eight plays, 57 yards, like a hot knife right through butter. 
and uh, Traymond Williams is the one who jumped uh, on the offsides, which is just kind of fitting because you talk about the $62 million in salary money on the defensive side. Williams was one of the big pickups here, and I'm not bashing him, you know, it could have been anybody that jumped off sides. He's going to be in the spotlight because of that. But and I like the way he's played so far here uh, in his position. You know, he hasn't been he hasn't been burnt too much here throughout the season. But better than screen door. We were talking. My son and I were talking about that yesterday. But uh, some lessons learned. Yeah. By the way, some lessons learned yesterday. I'll say it again. Uh, even though Philip Rivers had what three three fifty six or whatnot uh, yesterday, uh, none of those guys got over the top for the most part, except for that touchdown down. Uh, down in the end zone there that looked like it was going to be the go ahead for good for San Diego before the Browns came or came back down and, and did their drive at the end. That was a, a really nice pass. But other than that, uh, a good job of keeping those guys in front of them. So hopefully some, some good lessons learned there for guys like Desir who got in there. Justin Gilbert at least contributed a little bit in the kick return game, but what a damn shame. I mean, you got bad out there playing corner over the guy that was drafted number eight in the pick last uh, last year. And that, of course, is going to go on the Ray Farmer epitaph. All right, guys, we're going to talk about it with you guys, with Dan Wismar, 216-539-7535, 216-539-7535. Let's take a break. Let's get Dan in on the conversation. As a matter of fact, before I do, let's see. Let's hit the phone lines a little bit. Had a message here left from you guys before we uh, – got rolling i'm gonna hit this up as we roll again 216-539-7535 facebook and twitter facebook.com slash the sports fix twitter at the sports fix cle what are your thoughts on the browns and the latest kick in the gut here against the san diego chargers on facebook i had you guys hitting me up here as well several (laughs) several comments that i can't read on the air several that i can as well the majority, of course, put the blame on the defense and how uh, this team is uh, various shades of brown and not the brown that they put on the uniform. Jason Cato says defense sucks. They find new ways to lose. Connie says just wait until next year. Uh, <laughs> you know what? Good point there, Jason, on Facebook. says You guys realize Bruce Arians wanted to come here and the Browns turned him down. I Hey, don't get me started because that was my choice for head coach before uh, 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 um, young young Mr. Chud. And nobody nobody wanted to know my opinion on that one either. Oh, yeah, Bruce Arians was here before. He was here before. He's an old guy. We don't want an old court. We want one of those newfangled coordinators. That was what I was getting, especially from the thrust of the uh, super smart Twitter crowd. No offense out there, but some guys on Twitter think that they're, you know, Twitter PhDs or whatever, and uh, yet they've never had the chance to run their own football team. I think they should get a shot at it. and Because uh, they all told me nobody wants the old man, Bruce Arians. He was here before. We don't need him. If he was that good, we wouldn't have let him go. I, I love that guy. I wanted him then. I want him now. I'd trade first round draft pick for him. I'm just saying. I'll trade. I'm, we don't do anything good with him anyway. They don't get to play. So I'd trade a, a guy that's not going to get to play for a for a coach that can uh, that can do some things. But good point there, Jason as well. Uh, let's see. Go into the phone lines here. Who left us a message? I'm going to go. Play the hotline. This is you. Don't forget, you guys can always leave your take 24-7 on the hotline. 216-539-7535. 216-539-7535. Like this caller. Yeah, J-Rock. I'm still looking for that elite defense. (laughs) Uh, Matter of fact, Hayden didn't play yesterday because he's still embarrassed from the first three games. What I'd like to know is... Why there is 57 stories about the Browns, the Cavs uh, play their exhibition game tonight, the wine and gold, and the Indians had three straight winning seasons. Not a word on any of the TV channels. Just uh, wanted to make my point. You know, this town (laughs) is, you know, a losing town because they support nothing but the losers. Hey, hey, hey. Thank you. Talk to you later. Well, I won't go that far, but I hear your I hear you and I feel your pain, my man. 216-539-7535. I do get I get where he's coming from. Now, I will put an asterisk. I'm I'll take it. Hey, I don't give back winning seasons. I will put an asterisk on the on the Indians thing because it's three straight seasons that should have been, should have been, should have been better than they were. 
and they did great runs in the second half to make them better. But each of the three seasons has felt like a painful repeater of the season before. This, to me, and I, you know what? We said this last year, and we've got six months of hot stove talk to go. They're going to end it right where they ended it, or start it right where they ended it with Boston at Progressive Field. Swept them this weekend. But this is a crucial offseason because you have to you have to pick up you have to pick it up and carry it to the next level you cannot have this again with the here we go we make no changes we're happy with where we were we start the same and then here we are in july going well the indians just need a 10 game winning streak to get themselves back to 500 then we can start playing some ball no they've got to pick up the pieces here build around what they got a lot of good and i'll tell you what dan will probably say it again when he comes back here but uh I agree with him. I'm happier and not happier. I'm more comfortable with where they are now than earlier in this season. Definitely more than the Browns, as he said last week. But I'm more comfortable with where they are now because I do believe they didn't just get through the second half of a season and win some games. I think they may have found a couple more pieces, real pieces here, that will answer some of the questions and leave less holes to fill hell the less holes to fill the better we'll talk about that though try but to sweep and they finish 81 and 80 that's why i say we put an asterisk on it because they only played 161 i'll call this a 500 season i don't know that i'll call it a winning season doesn't matter it's still better than the alternative it's definitely better than what the winning percentage is going to be for the browns and i hate to say it listen man i'm not one of them guys oh well they're gonna just go one and 15 I'm just saying their chances of winning games deplete when the winnable games get lost on the schedule. And that's kind of what they did with this one and three start. What does Dan Wismar think? We're going to talk about all of this, the Buckeyes, and so much more. Zeke, big Zeke, bailed him out the other day. That one, that one was hard fought for the Buckeyes. What do you think about him? We'll see what Dan Wismar of Everybody Hates Cleveland thinks. Talking Browns. Buckeyes, we haven't even touched anything. The NFL slate of games, some good games, or some good finishes too. Over, how about last night? Did you? We'll, we'll, we'll talk with Dan in a minute. Did you guys catch the end of the Sunday night game with uh, Dallas and New Orleans and the way that went down? Uh, craziness at the at the finish. Here comes the, the the Saints. Boom, down roll they go. Field goal. Off the upright, no good at the end, and they did a. a they, it all played out. You milk the clock down, and then you're thinking, oh, here we go, overtime, and then whoop, one second or oh, 13 seconds into overtime, and that would be the end of that one. Sudden, quick finish to that, and uh, that was a crazy finish. There's crazy overtime as well with what Jacksonville and Indianapolis and. Cincinnati 4-0, Baltimore Thursday, of course, they got the victory. We'll talk some NFL, Browns, Buckeyes, Indians, Cavs, and more with Dan Wismar of Everybody Hates Cleveland joining us next. You guys, continue to leave your take on the hotline, 216-539-7535, 216-539-7535. When we come back, Dan Wismar joins us, and we'll hit the circle of, of all the weekend activities, starting with the Browns, coming up next after the news here on the Sports Fix. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound. A dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and distance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into... The Sports Fix. We'll be right back. Hey guys, before we go to the break, I want to talk to you a little bit again about our good friends at Harry Buffalo North Olmsted, the UFC, the ultimate fighting championships, some of the hottest fights in the world today, each and every one of their huge events. 
Harry Buffalo is one of the few places in Northeast Ohio you can go there and watch each and every UFC fight at the Harry Buffalo. And let me tell you, I've been there. The people are out the door. They are to the rafters. It is one of the craziest environments for some UFC fights. Wing Mondays, they've ganks in every day of the week. There's a different special, a different deal. And don't forget the Bison Burger, the unbelievable. It is the combination of a fantastic burger and eating healthy combined into one unbelievable sandwich you have got to get a bison burger while you're there so whatever you're looking for whatever day of the week monday through friday saturday sundays there's something for you at the harry buffalo north olmstead just outside great northern mall check them out today harry buffalo join the herd it's an addiction the sports fix will be right back how to be a great dad in 15 seconds Bike ride, go fish, walk in the park, phone call, milkshake, play catch, picnic, fly a kite, tell jokes, laugh, talk, read a story, tell a story, bumper car, swing set, bowling, pillow fight, cut loose, stay tight. Because the smallest moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. Take time to be a dad today. Call 877-4DAD-411 or visit fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. Every single night, every single practice, every single game, we got to give it all we got because they're going to ride with us. Everything that we do on this floor because of this city, we owe them. We're going to grind for this city. They're going to support us, man, but we got to give it all back to them. We get it done. The toughness that we have on the court is going to come from this city. Everybody, the whole city of Cleveland, that's what it's all about. It's time to bring them something special. Let's go. Bring it on in, everybody. Let's go. Hard work on three. Together on six. One, two, three. Hard work. Four, five, six. Together. One, two, three. Hard work. Four, five, six. Portions of the Sports Fix brought to you by Signs and Ship, the official printing source of the Sports Fix. Locations in Ohio, Pennsylvania, Virginia, and Florida. Find out more at signsandship.com. News break. Good morning, I'm Bob Picosi. Their 2-0 starts. The Cowboys are now 2-2, two and two, and they have to play the defending Super Bowl champion Patriots next Sunday. At 80-yard, Drew Brees to C.J. Spiller touchdown pass in overtime. Gave the Saints a 26-20 win over Dallas last night. But Cowboys coach Jason Garrett liked what he saw in Brandon Whedon in his team's two-minute offense. You know, we were in a mode where we're still huddling, but at different times we were on the ball. And I thought he really did a good job you know, going the right place with the ball, making a lot of good throws. And uh, we had some matchups that we liked and uh, did a good job kind of fighting through. Whedon is filling in for Tony Romo, who's out with a broken collarbone. Only one team in the NFL is still searching for its first win. That would be Detroit. The Lions take an 0-3 record into Seattle in Monday Night Football at 8.30 Eastern time on ESPN. Astros center fielder Carlos Gomez, who missed the last three games of the regular season with an intercostal muscle injury, says he'll definitely be in the lineup tomorrow night when Houston visits the Yankees in the American League Wild Card game. 8 Eastern time on ESPN TV, 7.30 Eastern on ESPN Radio. TSNPhilly.com reporting the Phillies have given the Marlins permission to interview Larry Boa for their managing job. Quarterback and Subway famous fan Marcus Mariota has a new sidekick. Watch as he gears up for the season ahead and the hilarious new video series Trophy Talk. Grab your favorite sub and catch Trophy Talk at YouTube.com slash Subway. Subway, eat fresh. Hey everybody, this is Jerry the King Lawler from WWE and you're listening to the Sports Fix. Welcome back to the Sports Fix Live. J-Rock back with you. Dan Wismar from Everybody Hates Cleveland getting ready to join me on the hotline. You guys, as we're talking about, we're going to talk about a lot of things. We're going to start off with the Cleveland Browns tough loss yesterday, as we mentioned, in San Diego. Might have mentioned that in the first 40 minutes or so of this broadcast. And, uh, yeah, Browns lost yesterday. And we're going to talk about that. With, and we're going to talk Buckeyes, go around the NFL, talk some tribe, Cavs got a scrimmage going on. There is a lot to get into. So if you want to keep joined in the, if you want to 
keep joined in with us. Let's try it that way. On the conversation, I think I see uh, my man Ron running the, the tweets over there. Hit us up on Facebook, on Twitter, facebook.com slash the sports fix, Twitter at the sports fix, C L E, email the sports fix at AOL.com. Let us know your thoughts as the conversation rolls on. And, and before I, as I'm getting ready to pull uh, Dan up here into the uh, into the conversation, just a couple of things. Uh, as I noticed some breaking news here throughout the morning, Philbin's gone already as the head coach of the Miami Dolphins, and it's been an ugly start to the season. For, you know what? On one of my fantasy football leagues yesterday, I, I literally noticed that I had, I said, why in the hell do the Miami Dolphins defense why do I have the Miami Dolphins deep? I couldn't even I can't even remember what where, where I had them, but I don't know what I was thinking. Apparently they were highly touted. I don't know. Maybe that was the weekend that I went on a crack smoking binge and didn't realize it. I don't know what happened, but I ended up with the Miami Dolphins defense on one of my fantasy football teams. Let me just tell you, that's not exactly a, a game winning uh, strategy. I'll put it to you that way. Apparently, head coach Joe Philbin doesn't have much game winning strategy, at least as far as the Dolphins are concerned. He was hit the bricks day today in Miami for him, as it was for Matt Williams. Hey, he used to play for the Indian. Remember him? Matt Williams played for the Giants, played for the Tribe, uh, head uh, manager in Washington, no longer as he has been chopped off at the head. And they had all kinds of high expectations and low results compared to those high expectations. You saw it get crazy at the end with fighting in the dugout and all of that, that ugly scene with Harper and Pat Lebon there. So that will... Uh, That'll that'll be the, that'll be the, the the one that gets you when your players is fighting in the dugout. Your, your job security is not all that long, and that's just to show you, hey, that quick. We're four game quarter of the way into a season. Dolphins coach is gone. If you don't think that Mike Pettin's seat is warm, and I'm not saying it should be, shouldn't be. We're, we can go there later. I'm just saying. It gets warmer by the day. And by the way, speaking of days, today's the day that Ray Farmer returns to work from his four-game suspension. will be interesting to see how it goes as the Browns are now in the day after of their 41st last-minute loss since 1999. 41 of them. Unbelievable. Well, not if you've lived through it, but when you look at it on the back end, it's like looking at the pile of bodies on the side of the road. You go, man. I didn't realize there were that many casualties. We're all casualties of this team. Dan Wismar, everybody hates Cleveland. Dan, how are you feeling today, my man? Jerry, it's hard being a Browns fan. We know that. Um, <laughs> it's actually hard today. And, you know, when you when you take those 41 last-second, last-minute losses and you spread them out over 16 seasons, ah, that's a, it's just two to three every single year. You know, so – if you look at it that way, it's a little bit of perspective. But, you know, the Browns don't just disappoint their fans, Jerry, as you well know. They <laughs> like to rip their guts out and stomp on them on the floor. Yes. And and then, you know, let you put them back in later. You know, I, I had a little bit of a unique viewing experience of the Browns yesterday. My, my wife and I, we go to all the games together, and she had somewhere she needed to be yesterday afternoon for a couple hours. And, she said, well, you know, you're going to wait for me to get back before you watch a game. And sometimes when they're on the road, we will wait till like 2 o'clock to start watching the game, the 1 o'clock game, so we can watch it all the way through without commercials. Of course, you have to stay off Twitter and you have to stay off yes. the Internet so yes. you don't know the score. But, <laughs> but I can't stand the commercial breaks, and they just make me crazy. So there's so many and so long. So I really like watching the road games that way. So I didn't learn the result until about an hour after everyone else knew their oh. result. And somehow that made it even worse, uh, that I could have looked an hour earlier and spared myself the, the gun. It's tough. And, and I have one one major take on the game, Jerry, that I will just share with you. And, my, and that is that is not doing himself any favors. Mike Pettin, who everybody seemed to like and everybody thought was doing the right thing, the bloom is off his rose a little bit more in my eyes right now for two reasons mainly. Obviously, one is he's in charge of defense. Yes. Okay, and the defense has been miserable. So if that's his selling point, it's less a selling point after four games than it was before we started the season. Secondly, 
teams that commit a lot of penalties are typically teams that are poorly coached. Yes. Penalties are a function of coaching. Well-coached teams don't commit a lot of penalties. I mean, that just is sort of a truism in football. There's no other thing to blame it on or attribute it to. Yes, individual mistakes, sometimes physical, sometimes mental. But well-coached teams don't kill themselves with penalties. If you kill yourself with penalties, you're not a well-coached team, and that is, uh, that's on Mike Pettin. That loss yesterday is 90% on Mike Pettin. And you know what? I will say right in agreement with you. I don't know if you caught it earlier in the show, but for the most part, I have thought Mike Pettin to be a very genuine guy when he speaks to the media. And yesterday was the first crack in that to me because I caught him blatantly making excuses that were not only excuses, but that were untrue. And that was when he made the comment when asked why the defense couldn't get any pressure on Phillip Rivers. He said, well, Phillip Rivers is really hard to sack, except for the fact that the first few games completely disagree. He had been sacked nine times already, so he was not hard to sack this season, and yet the Browns' defense was unable to get near him when it mattered, or really for 85 90% of the game. Well, Jerry, they did pressure him, and certainly in the first series they pressured, and, and yeah, the thing they got the was, sack early. Philip yeah, Rivers, yeah. You know, if you if you uh, you know live by the blitz, you die by the blitz. Mm-hmm, so many mm-hmm. times the Browns sent they sent the house after Philip Rivers, and they failed to get to him. He killed. You know, the the big play of the game was the the Woodhead uh, center screen yeah. that, that you know went for fifty, sixty yards, sixty one. Um, yeah. And uh, you know that was when the Browns sent probably eight guys after the quarterback, and uh, and they had the perfect play call. In fact. Uh, with their crossing patterns and their screens, they had the perfect recipe to beat a blitzing, pressuring defense, and uh, yeah. they ran it to perfection. The Browns still haven't figured out how to stop a, a crossing pattern without giving up a 20-yard-plus gain. Uh, they did it constantly against them yesterday. Um, so, I don't know. It wasn't as though they failed to attempt to put pressure on the quarterback. Yeah. It's just that when they did, Rivers beat them with screens and and, uh, short crossing routes that that, uh, were just dialed up perfectly for the occasion. See, I I disagree with that to an extent because just to me – Loading up the box is not getting pressure on the quarterback. As, and to, as a matter of fact, if that's the only, and that's what gets me is that's the only way that Browns can even attempt to get any pressure. There's no disguised. Where is the exoticness at all? As a matter of fact, and here's a scary thought, guys. We were off on Friday. I was going to make this point. Mike Penton talked about scaling things back last week in the playbook, and I'm going, man. To me, that's not a good thing to hear. I mean, we're, we're we're not that crazy that we're scaling things back. We haven't been doing things that are that off the reservation to begin with. So how simple are you making the playbook at this point to try to get people to make tackles and make stops in the run game? But I get what you're saying. But if to me, you're counterproductive. If, all, if the only way you can get any kind of actual attempt at pressure is to load eight in the box, then you're giving yourself away with the other team and they're going to kill you because you can't stop those slants and those quick screens. I'm talking about without the blatant, hey, here comes everybody in your face. He's going to beat those all day long. But we have no ability to get any pressure in a general pass rush. And and I don't even know what you chalk that up to. Is it the, the talent of the players? Is it the scheme? Is it is it the – I don't know. And that's what's got me is that – in general, I mean, you looked at the end of the game, especially they they took that couple of clip montage of Rivers on those crossing patterns, and and literally he's sitting there with four and five seconds to scan the field, find the open man, let him break the route. They get to the rub and everything, and you're like, wow, man. I mean, those are the things I'm talking about. That's where we're not eight in the box, we're not bringing the house. We just can't get any pressure standardly. Or in we don't disguise any type of real crazy defense. We will occasionally, but not much. And I think our our defense is so easy to read. Well, that may be, and and that and the fact that we don't have uh, uh, you know a Demarcus Ware or, or oh, yeah. uh, you know uh, 
you know, one of those types of pass rushers playing on the defensive line and an outside linebacker. You know, we don't, uh, you know, we don't have a, a stud player there. We we paid big money to Paul Kruger, and Paul Kruger was pretty much invisible yesterday. Um, you know, Mingo has yet to make a play this season. We spent a first round pick on him, so they, they realize that they that they have to draft pass rushers in this league or sign them as free agents, and they've done that. And either their scheme or the talent of the players, or or both, uh, hasn't resulted in in uh, you know a good enough pass rush. There were a lot of times that Philip Rivers made completions yesterday on his way to being on his back yes. and only yes. to look up and see that the play succeeded. Um, you know, I, I guess maybe you could just say it was the, he was the wrong quarterback to yeah. try to, you know, have a, uh, you know, five alarm fire blitz against because he's just too experienced and too savvy to do that. He was so good yesterday. I mean, really, you could just see him directing that offense and having his way at times with the some of those. I'm going, man, is this is this Peyton Manning we're watching here? He's literally he's given lessons at the line of scrimmage to the to the offensive lineman. Now you make sure you pick up this guy and you watch him over there. And I'm like, man, that's uh that's I would love. I, I cannot wait for the day. I don't care what the name on the back of his jersey is, I don't care what it is. I cannot wait for the day that that is a weekly occurrence for the Cleveland Browns because uh, Phillip Rivers is a hell of a quarterback, which is why I was worried about the Browns' chances coming into this game anyway. Offensively, uh, San Diego had a ton of weapons, and they used every one of them. But it was the Browns' offense that I didn't think was going to have enough to keep up. Before we, before I ask you anything about that, I want to go back to something you said uh in the last little thing that you were saying about how the Browns don't just lose, you know, they, they rip your guts out when they do it. And, and it made me think of yesterday. And, and as I'm watching the end of the game, I'll, I'll bet you 90% of the people listening can, would appreciate to this statement here. You knew the Browns were going to lose. Like you knew that there was a minute and a half or whatever. You knew that San Diego was going to drive down and kick the field goal. Like I just don't know anybody watching that didn't know that San Diego was about to drive down. That's how the Browns play. But what you didn't know, even the most Cleveland people didn't know that he was going to miss the field goal, we were going to jump off sides, and they were going to get a second kick at it and then beat us in just a, a miserable way instead of just the bad way that we were going to go down. And that's where I'm like, man, that's not just losing. That's making an art form out of it. Yeah, that's what they, they called on Twitter last night, the brownsiest way to lose. Yes, um, yes. You know, it was it was just so fitting. It was just so perfect that the, that that's it's the Dwayne Rudd syndrome. It really was, um, though. Hey, that was the know, closest to Dwayne Rudd since we've had it, basically, except we had that game <laughs> won. We had one that game thing, won. One other thing, just, I'm just going to say, one other thing sticks with, with me with, uh, with the Mike Patton conversation. Yes, and that is, and it was not a post-game quote of his, but it was a quote that the, the broadcasters made during the game. They were talking about the pass interference, and they were talking about the problems with penalties, and and what, uh, quoted Mike Patton pre-press conferences, interviews, or whatever, when he said, "We're aggressive. Uh, we play aggressive," and then he said, "We're not going to change the way we play," and. That was one of Mike Pettin's ways of describing uh, or, or sort of justifying having a lot of penalties. Why do you have a lot of penalties? Well, because we play aggressive, uh, and and then we're not going to change the way we play. And that those words kept ringing in my ears yes. for the rest of the evening after we saw Tremont Williams jump off sides on the field goal attack. We're not going to change the way we play. Really, Mike? Really? You know, you're averaging double-digit penalties over the last couple of games, and you're not going to change the way you play. And, again, I understand the context it was set in, but I couldn't help, you know, revisiting that quote uh, where he was quoted by the broadcasters during the game as we're not going to change the way we play as being maybe one of the dumbest things a head coach ever said who's one and three. Exactly, because, like, right there, that point, 
I would be going to my listen. I I I I've said something similar t- to a friend. I said about about peeling back the aggressiveness to avoid like there. Um, you know, think about what you said. We're not going to change the way we play. So that means you're you're not going to go to your guy and go listen. I mean, it's not like we've got a bunch of mad dogs in the meat market here. At least not really. We maybe they got the kind that Marty thought he drafted, but we don't. We're not. We're not exactly going to be peeling back the pit bulls and putting them on a leash here. It's not like they're attacking with ferocity. That if we go, hey guys, wait an extra half a second before you jump. Let's not do the stupid penalties here. You're not. It, in my opinion, you're. Not not going to turn the Seattle defense into a, a bunch of puppy dogs. That's not what. That's not going to be your problem. So I disagree, and I'm with you. I agree with the the part that you said because uh, uh, th- that that's stupid right there. You you want aggression, but you don't want stupid. What good is aggression if you're aggressive for 59 and a half minutes and it costs you the game and 52 other people are going home with an L on their chest as well because. You and it wasn't just one player, but because somebody had to try. It's like blocking the punt the week before. Uh, you you couldn't just go after the punt, but three or four of you undisciplined guys had to go co- corral the punter at the same time. Like those stupid things have nothing to do with aggression. Those are undisciplined football by players that are not being coached or not being disciplined for being undisciplined. Yeah, that's right, and that's what I mean earlier about yeah. you know penalties are a function of coaching. Uh, you know, you can take the penalty total for the team. It wasn't one player committing twelve penalties, uh, right. you know, and and it's, even some of the pass interference ones are slightly understandable. When you have a Pierre Desir who played a wonderful game, I thought even on the touchdown he got beat on. He had good coverage on the guy, uh, but when you've got a you know when your when your personnel situation is so bad that you'd rather have Jonathan Batamosi, your reserve safety, I playing know. cornerback in an NFL game than you would to put Justin Gilbert on the field. You've got some real problems. And so when Jonathan Batamosi makes a, a a dumb penalty trying to you know, hold on to a guy to keep him from coming back to catch a football, maybe he's going to get away with it, maybe he's not. But those penalties, you can at least say, okay, we're undermanned at the cornerback position today, if not every day. And uh, we're, uh, you know, you're going to get those calls. And, and there were calls, obviously, on – on both sides, and uh, and then cornerback's the toughest position in pro sports to play, in my opinion. So that's even yeah. understandable. But for the most part, the penalties were were, were bad coaching, a, a nil-disciplined team, and that falls squarely on Mike Batten's head. For sure. Batamosi was getting beat on that one. He literally just grabbed the jersey. I looked at little Jerry, I said, hey, if I'm him, I'm grabbing that guy's jersey too because otherwise I'm getting beat for a 20-yard touchdown down the field. Right, and, and, so. and frankly, I'm glad, I'm glad that NFL officials are calling that because it's been yeah. going on for the last few years, and, and I'm glad that, you know, DBs are no longer allowed to grab the guy. What I do wish, and there was one penalty that should have been called where uh, I can't even remember which receiver might have been Gabriel, uh, sprinting down the right sideline, and the and the DB has his hand in front of him as it restraining him from getting by him. Now he's got his right arm pointed down inside position, but he's he's reaching out and and on his legs, not not up high where he can see it and where the ref can see it, but down low in the midsection and the legs, restraining the receiver from getting by him, and it ended up being overthrown, and there was no call. Um, to me, pass interference is still the most inconsistently called and poorly called uh, penalty in, in the NFL. Um, I don't, you know, it, it, there's a slight improvement being made this year, especially with the obvious grabbing is being called. But sometimes that's not even the, the worst offense. It's the, the arm bars and the holding down of a receiver's arms and grabbing him while the ball is still in the air, those kinds of things that still go uncalled much of the time. Yeah, that's gonna be you know that's something that's with the subjectiveness of the way they call it. I'm with you. It's definitely the most uh, inconsistently called thing throughout the uh, throughout the NFL for sure. Um, you know what? Let's switch over. Let's let's talk about the Browns' offense for a minute. And and I I started the show kind of talking about this. And I'll start with McCown because to me, again, two weeks in a row, I will repeat what I said last week. You won. I'm sorry. The Browns screw a lot of things up, and 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 we all know, and we bash them to no end. The Browns won the Josh McCown lottery when they signed him. You were gonna get 
Josh McCown one, two, whatever version, they got the best version of him so far early on. I mean, if you continue to get this level of play out of him each and every week, you won, call it a win, chalk it up and, and say, hey, we did okay at the quarterback position this year until we figure out the long-term solution because uh, I've got to say, that was a hell of a game he played yesterday, and especially uh, that drive at the end. I mean, he's got some, even Hoyer, you know, with his in, in, inaccuracies at times. Some quarterbacks have something where they're able to lead those drives, where they just they make big throws, they make good plays. Josh McCown can't win games, as I said earlier. For the life of him, he can't win these games, but he can play well in them. And uh, this is definitely a high-level version of him. Uh, it definitely reminded me of that good run that he had with the Bears a few years ago. But he played very well, put the Browns in position to win, and, and he stood tall with some heat. There were a couple of plays that I – there's no way that the other quarterback on the roster makes that. It just doesn't happen. I don't care what anybody thinks. Uh, you cannot blame anything at the feet of him because he is more, to me, more than delivered what you expected out of him and the Browns' offense in the passing game. Yes, yeah, certainly you're right. And if nothing else, uh, the last two weeks might have, you know, gagged the Johnny Manziel fans just a little bit, uh, kept them quiet or, or, or hushed them up a little bit. Uh, oftentimes you look at, at passing statistics and when a guy, when a team is passing 40 times and a quarterback has, you know, 350, 400 yards passing, chances are they lost the game. And, and the last two weeks, Josh McCown's had two 300-yard passing games, and the Browns have lost them both. And usually that's a function of coming from behind, having to throw the ball, especially late in the game. But that was not the case in this game. The Browns no. were not behind until the very end. They were right in it within a field goal the entire game, uh, fell behind then 20-16, to 16 and, and had to battle back from there. Um, but, uh, I mean, 32 out of 41, 78%, 356. Right. You're right. Some of the plays he made were, were veteran uh, accurate throws, uh, and I'm talking about, you know, the passes to Barnage, the, the touchdown pass, the two-point conversion pass. They were pinpoint. They were right there. And you have to give some credit to uh, to Deep Lippo for, for a lot of that, too. I was I was fairly happy with the play calling. He obviously had some play calls blow up on him. Try a little do a swing pass out to Duke Johnson to get stuff for a loss. Or, you, yeah. you, you know, you, you have a, a little screen that you tried to fake one way, go the other way with a screen pass. Thank God we, we find out that we have a screen pass in the playbook. <laughs> uh, they, they, blew, they blew it up on us, but uh, maybe they can watch some film of, uh, of Philip Rivers and Danny Woodhead to see how a screen is run. But uh, that, that's uh, – still, those things aside, i I, I got to tip my head a little bit to Deep Lippo for having a good plan and, and for the most part, uh, McCown being on top of it and able to execute it. Um, I, I, I wish that they would be a little bit less predictable – on second and less than five, in other words, you get a good run from Crowell or Duke Johnson on first down, and you get six or seven yards, and then it's second and three, second and four. Like night follows day, though, on second down, we would try an up-the-gut run to the running back uh, on second and four, and typically we'd end up with third and four, third and five. I can't tell you how many times that happened yesterday. Probably not as many as my as my memory tells me, but um, – I wish they'd uh, mix it up a little bit on on second and short because it, he just seemed awfully predictable in those situations. But again, Flip called a good game and, and McCown executed it. And and there's you know it was good to see Duke Johnson uh, become more involved. That that's very promising. And in fact, it was a very Brownsy thing, uh, as, as they say. To uh, <laughs> when when I was thinking earlier in the game when Duke Johnson was kind of asserting himself, and after he catches the long TD on a great catch and and dragging his feet uh, through the end zone and everything else, doing everything right, that you see him getting carted off next quarter. You oh, know, I know. God, you, know you, you just find a guy like that, and now they're kicking him off on a cart. But um, obviously he uh, he was able to come back in the game, and, and he was one of the bright spots, certainly, uh, as well as McCown uh, for the game, if, uh, if you're looking for a glass half full kind of stuff. And now you're starting to see why guys like us and some others were so excited when the Browns drafted Duke Johnson. He was behind the eight ball a bit with the injury. I didn't expect him to be down the field catching 60-yard touchdown pass. And by the way, all the people last week who said, oh, well, you know, McCown couldn't get the deep ball. And, I, hey, 
he dropped it in the bucket on that over the shoulder in the back corner there to Duke Johnson. That was as beautiful a pass and a catch as you're going to see. And to have it pulled off by a running back, the, uh, to me, that I don't, that play is not even in the playbook. I don't even know where that came from, but they pulled it off. But, uh, again, the deep ball, the accuracy was there. Um, and and I'm you're talking about a guy who wanted nothing to do with Josh McCown, still would trade him for a lot of other quarterbacks. I mean, he in no way was my ideal signing for the Browns, but I don't care. Like, effectively, what he's done is shown me that job, at least right now, uh, better than anybody else we have, and that that's all you can ask for at this point, and I'm, I'm very pleasantly surprised. So the minute anybody wants to take the conversation in that direction, we just don't have anything else to talk about. I mean, w- would you agree with this? I'm just curious your thoughts. I mean, I think we're both in the same place when it comes to Johnny Mans anyway, but I'll tell you that I don't think the Browns have the chance to – blow themselves out of the game at the end with the with the penalty. I don't think it even they don't lose that close of a situation if the other quarterbacks in there. I just don't. I do believe that that even though you still lost the game and there's an argument, is it better to lose good games, close game or not that that was a good way to lose, but is it better to to lose a hard-fought game at the end behind the veteran quarterback or do you just get murdered every week and throw the rookie out there and and see what happens? That's the argument I think that people are are going to be making here very soon and and are already making it and I'm curious where you are on that because there does come a point where I say if in any if you don't play Johnny Manziel at some point, then clearly you have no intention of ever playing him, and I'm fine with that too if that's your decision because I don't think he's going to work out. But uh, what is that point with what we've seen out of this team here? What would that point be for you? Well, I guess it might be you know one and six instead of one and three, you know, uh, okay. or, or something like that when the season truly is in the dumper for sure. Uh, and, and uh, you know, I agree with you that, that the Browns are not anywhere close to going to overtime with the Chargers uh, if Johnny Manziel plays in that game. Yep. Uh, you, you talked about a quarterback, some quarterbacks having that, that uh, you know, intangible or that it factor, whatever you want to call it. It's experience, Jerry, in my opinion. Yes. I, yes. I think it's just, yeah, he's a bigger guy, stronger arm, or at least a strong arm. Uh, arguable how accurate his arm is, but he did, as you said, he made some great throws yesterday. But it's experience. It's having been there. It's late in the game in an NFL game in the fourth quarter, down four points, and and you got a 90 yards, you know, field in front of you. Uh, Manziel's never done that. At least Josh McCown has done that before. Uh, been in those situations and been there, and he was cool and and uh, you know calm under pressure and executed some some throws, some very good throws and knew where to go with it. Uh, they did a little bit of, quite a bit of two back field. Uh, we've been waiting for that. We finally saw a lot of it, and it worked. Um, and uh, even on that last drive, he hit Johnson a couple times. What do you have, 10, 12 catchers in the game? Yeah, um, nine completions, yeah. It. Oh, nine, nine he had, nine for 85. Uh, but, yeah, that's it. But no no argument whatsoever with you that uh, the Browns aren't in that game, let alone uh, in a position to go to overtime you know, save a penalty uh, with Manziel playing. It's just not close. So when does that time come? I, I like you, don't believe that Manziel is the guy, and so I don't re- I'm don't. i not itching for a chance to see what this kid <laughs> can do kind of thing like the Manziel fans are. There's a lot of people that just really, really want to see that. Uh, I think they have a better chance to, uh, you know, to win with him. I, I think they're crazy. Uh, and, and maybe McCown will go, you know, 3-13 and 13 this year. But at least you're giving the other 52 players on the team uh, their best shot at you know coming out of the game a winner, and, and that's important if you want to keep the locker room behind you. Yeah, and here's another argument. Somebody made made this uh, point to me over the weekend when you know they're obviously wanting the Browns to play Manziel, not because they think he's better, but because they they just want to see you know what's the point. We're gonna lose anyway, so lose with the kid. And I'm like, well, the longer they wait, it should be telling to you too because you're you're because his answer is well, if the Browns play McCown all season and and Manziel only plays the meaningless last couple games of the season, then you still have to evaluate him next year. And I said, see, that's the part of the equation that some fans differ from others and that I differ from you is that 
you only have to do that if you've convinced yourself that he is your future. If you've already told yourself that this guy is not where we're going, there's no you don't have to go into next well, well now we have to start Johnny Manziel in 2016. Not if they've already made up their mind. And and I've got to tell you, I don't know if it's the organization, but this head coach has already made up his mind in many ways about the backup quarterback that he has. And he can't spell that out any more clearly than the way this thing is played out. Because I'll stick to what I said last week. I think in most other developmental franchises, because that's the level that I think the Browns are at with some of this stuff. I'm talking about the franchises that are consistently two, three, four win seasons every year. I think in any of them, I think Manzo A starts from the get go because they're just gonna throw the kid out there from the get go. Or B, he's he's playing already. The minute he would have won that first game, the coach would have just caved to the wave of public pressure and said, Hey, we're gonna roll with the kid and see what happens. And the fact that the Browns have done none of those things tells me that at least the coaching staff, not that they won't give him a shot here and there, but they 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 they've already made their decisions and you may not like that. That may be a reason you want him fired, but that's what it comes across to me is it's not like there's some big, big secret here. And because because people keep going, well, then you got to find out next year. I'm like, no, no, not necessarily. You don't. You don't have to find out anything next year. And uh, by the way, did you find it funny at all that they started th- or that they dressed three quarterbacks yesterday? Yeah, I wasn't even really aware of that uh, until I heard you mention it in the open. Uh, it was, uh, yeah, not something I was on top of. But you're right. I think that the other you know, elephant in the living room is uh, four million dollars for Austin Davis last week mm-hmm. uh, as a, another sign of where the front office uh, thinks uh, Johnny Manziel is in their little pecking order. So yeah, I think you're you're right that they have uh, largely made that decision. Now maybe uh, the new general manager and the new head coach next <laughs> year will have a different uh, have a different idea. I know, bite your tongue, right? Uh, it's coming. You it's, know, it's uh, coming, Dan. You know it. I, I, I do feel that it's coming, and, and Jimmy Haslam's silence uh, uh, has, has something to do with it. Uh, you know, I got to believe that he's making phone calls today. I mean, he's seeing – he saw that one in three Dolphins fire their head coach this morning, yep. and, uh, and he's seeing other guys in other sports, Matt Williams, other people, you know, biting the dust. And, you know, he's a guy that we know he's impatient, and we know he's uh, – Insistent on uh, on having a winner and being a success, and and I think more and more, just like you and me, uh, uh, my 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 feeling this morning is the, the the bloom is off the rose of Mike Pettin. That maybe that's a hasty judgment on my part. It's been a season no, and, a, I... and a quarter, um, and and the guy's likable, uh, but uh, he doesn't have a well coached football team on the field right now, a disciplined team, and that bothers me. You know what, Dan? Here's another thing that I want to throw out here that I wanted to wait for you to talk about is Ray Farmer's back on the job today. Dwayne Bowe is not looking good for Ray Farmer right now at all. And and you know that that was a situation where Jimmy looked at Ray Farmer in the offseason when he said, hey, I, I got a shot to sign my, my guy here. Well, what do you think? I think he can go. He gave me his word he can go. I think he's ready to go. So you know Ray Farmer put his name behind that signing. There's no doubt in my mind that's how the connection was made. So you know he put his name behind that. Plus, he's the general manager. Anytime you make a signing, you're, you're giving your stamp of approval to a guy. But the draft picks, there's a lot on the seat that is burning hot of Ray Farmer. He's just coming back off of a four-game suspension that everybody's talking about. So if, if you're Mike Pettin, you should be very fearful right now that Ray Farmer is not going to use you as a preemptive strike to try to save his own job today. Or not necessarily today, but, but before tomorrow. Because before you allow Jimmy Heslam to make the, the decision that everybody's got to go, if I'm Ray Farmer, at what point do I start thinking about, hey, if I cut this guy off at the pass and fire Mike Pettin and, and I can buy myself an extra year, I didn't, I didn't hire this guy to begin with. I was stuck with this guy. And so maybe I can sell Jimmy on giving me a fresh slate here. And, and I'm just saying, at what point does that become a real concern? Because you've now got a guy who's going to be on his own hot seat right next to Mike Pettin. Yeah, you're right. And and I don't know, you know, frankly, whether 
we, we can even be talking about one or the other of those guys going because True. I think we know enough about Jimmy Haslam to know that if he's going to go, he's going to go big. And he's going to go, he's going to have his sights set on, you know, John Gruden or Bill Parcells or somebody else to, to run the football operation for this team. I, Parcells obviously probably not interested, but, uh, you know, I, I have a feeling that uh, when Jimmy makes a move, he's going to make a splash and he's going to go, you know, house cleaning. And uh, it's not going to matter what uh, Mike Patton and Ray Farmer's little, uh, you know, intramural differences are. And to be honest with you, my my main reason for thinking that nothing, because my son, we were talking about this yesterday. He goes, well, do you think that it, any, it would happen during the season? I said, the only way Mike Pettin gets fired during the season is if Ray Farmer cuts his legs off from underneath him and tries to save his own self. Because to me, the one thing Jimmy would do is just wait for the season to be over and just like you said, clean the whole house out on the last day of the season. And part of the reason for that is they're not really anybody to step in. I mean, yeah, you could give it to, but you've already got some rookie coaches across the staff and you've got some guys. I mean, what are you going to do? Give it to, you know, you're going to, one of the reasons you'd be letting him go is the defense. So it's not exactly like you're going to hand it over to the defensive coordinator. What is John D. Filippo become the coach for a couple of weeks? I mean, so I do think that the only way it, anything happens during the season would be if Ray Farmer made something happen down the stretch of the season or, or one of those type of situations or, a, you know, something like that. Yeah. Otherwise, you're right. It's right. Hey, a- that's, and that's possible, I suppose, Jeremy. I don't think uh, I don't think Ray Farmer goes to the bathroom without checking with Jimmy Haslam first. And that's I, I quite mean, true. I, I just, you know, I honestly think that that's, that, that is the case. And uh, I, just, I don't think he would – be permitted by the owner <laughs> to make that kind of a move in midseason. Really, I don't. Uh, and, I think, and maybe I don't give him enough credit for being his own man or for, or for having truly having the power in the organization to uh, really affect everything relating to the football side of the operation. Uh, but I don't see that. Let me ask you something, Dan. And I mean, this is us and we have common sense and we do things differently than the Browns do sometimes. So maybe this answer won't make sense. But for the past four weeks, if you're Ray Farmer, what in the world is going through your mind as for the first time? You know, it's different when you're in the bubble. Right now, this show is different to you and I than it is to the people listening because we're in it and doing it. And it's not until you you get on the outside and you watch and you listen and you go back and listen to the episode and you go, oh, okay, that's a, that's, ah, and that sounded good or that sounded bad or whatever. So when you're in the bubble week to week, you're, you're, you're in the crossfire. He's been sitting at home for four weeks, unable to go to the office. He can't interact with people. He's watching it all from the outside. What in the world would you be thinking if you were Ray Far- Legitimately, even if you think your plan was good going into the season, what are you thinking if you're Ray Farmer right now watching? Are you just making excuses on why things have gone bad? Are you panicking at this point? What would you be doing if you're Ray Farmer? Well, I think I'd maybe be scouting pass rushers or, or something or trying to be trying to be productive with my time. Uh, maybe just reevaluating the defensive talent that he has on hand. Maybe he thought he'd get more, more pass rush out of, uh, you know, Mingo and Armani Bryant and Paul Kruger and Scott Solomon, uh, who of course is hurt, but, you know, maybe he thought he'd be getting, uh, you know, sack after sack sack with uh with mike petton's uh inventive approach to defense and with the talent that he has assembled around him uh maybe he thought that danny shelton would would uh cement that run defense uh better than it has and, and so maybe he's uh second guessing his own judgments on talent evaluation or uh if he's doing what most general managers do he's he's scouting both college and professional talent to see what he can do to upgrade the roster yeah, I'm sure he spent a lot of time. I'm just curious. I mean, it from the outside. So you, you'd be interesting to see what he says when he comes back, the whole ship to change or anything like that. But it'll be interesting what he says uh, when he when he does come back here. And uh, we'll see, man. It's, it's going to be interesting. It, it gets it gets tougher from here. They got Baltimore coming up, and uh, Baltimore got their first win of the season again. This is another one that, you know, you would say – this is a you know should be a winnable game, et cetera, and so forth. But uh, you know there, that, that's that's n- nothing like that can be said about where this team is here. Real quick, something I wanted to bring up and I'm trying to remember, I think it was Terry Pluto uh, that I that I, re- I read a bunch of articles this morning 
and I think it was Pluto that uh, mentioned when you talked about, you know, maybe it's overthinking your scheme sometimes, but he mentioned with Paul Kruger, you know, last year he had 11 sacks. And one of the switches that they made defensively this year was moving him from weak side to strong side. And he's got nothing. He's got, what, a half a sack this season or something like that? I mean, he he's not even yeah. anywhere near the quarterback. Last year we were finally going, hey, Paul Kruger's finally got loose a little bit here, man, and he's starting to make some of that money that we're paying him. And they switch him, and he's he's literally disappear, disappeared from the game plan. Yeah, and that's been noticeable. Uh, and, you know, the fact that Solomon won a starting job, a uh, guy you picked up off the scrap heap, you know, wins a starting pass for the talent that they have. But Kruger sort of underachieving for a couple of seasons now it tells you something else. If these guys are your starters – because the Markevious Mingos and, and then Armani Bryant slashes a little bit. And, and he's another guy who has undergone a position switch under Patton. Yeah. Um, but uh, again, your, your talent isn't what you thought it was. You're not getting the productivity out of them. And again, it gets back to, to the coaching of that defense and uh, how, you know, the coach's job is to maximize the production that you get with the talent that you have based on scheme and, and, uh, so far, it's uh, it's an underachieving unit. Yeah, you could say that for sure. What what are your hopes for? Well, we we don't have to get like specific, but what are your what are your hopes for moving forward here, Baltimore? I mean, obviously, this is a tough one in any normal situation to to shake off here, but it, for even tougher here with the way the season has started. What do you what do you, what kind of Browns effort do you think comes off of this? Because this is one where they either keep fighting or they they start kicking it down early in the season. I'm hoping that's not the the case, but. Uh, it'll be interesting. How do you expect well, you to know, see them? Well, they, they, they competed yesterday in San Diego. They competed oh, yeah. like a legitimate NFL team. And, um, you know, it, it was we knew it was going to be tough to go to San Diego and win. Those guys had their backs against the wall at one and two. I told my wife yesterday, she always asks me, you know, well, so how good is San Diego supposed to be? Or how good is this or that opponent supposed to be? And I said, well, they're an NFL team. So outside of the Packers and Patriots, and there, there's a whole bunch of mediocrity in the middle, and we're in it. <laughs> um, you know, there's not there's not that much difference between the best and the worst in the NFL. So any given Sunday kind of thing. Um, you know, the Browns should have won the game last year in Baltimore with uh, Connor Shaw starting, for heaven's sake. I mean, we competed with them. Um, and, uh, you know, they had two close games with Baltimore last year. Baltimore's a hurting team. Baltimore should be 0-4 if Mike yeah. Tomlin isn't a numbskull on Thursday night. Uh, I mean, the, the Steelers had that game won and, and really gave it away. So, you know, the, this this Browns team can go to Baltimore and compete and, and be in the game. And will they figure out some creative way to rip their fans' guts out and stomp on them on the ground? Maybe. <laughs> you know, if you're a betting man, you might think that they probably will. Um, but, no, they're, they're, they're going to be in it. So they have, uh, they have, you know, NFL talent and uh, – you know, they're, they're hurt by injuries, but so is every other team in the league. No, absolutely. We saw that yesterday. I mean, that's why I couldn't use the injuries on the Browns even as part of the conversation because I'm watching San Diego lose players as the game goes on, and they had guys step up. How about Inman? He had the big catch where Mingo, the first play he's made all season, ran him down at the one-yard line and uh, – came from the cross side of the field and everything. I will give him that. He he ran that guy down. But Inman came in, had a couple of big catch. I think he had the touchdown catch there, too. And uh, he stepped in, stepped up and stepped in when he needed to. So, you know, every team gets hurt, and it's only going to get worse going through. A couple of things, um, just looking at it as we talked about. Uh, Duke Johnson, by the way, one reception away from the Browns' uh, most receptions in a game by a running back, Ernest Viner, Lee. Roy Horde, Greg Pruitt, the other names on that list. Those are some uh, some good company to be in. I really do think that Duke Johnson, I said it when the Browns drafted him, I think that he's going to be a, a Ernest Biner type back in the NFL that's going to be a consistently a thousand yards from scrimmage. They may not all come in one way or the other, but he's going to he's going to consistently be one of those guys. Yesterday was the first time the Browns had two running backs, both over a hundred yards combined uh, in from scrimmage in like eleven years. So there's at least some hope there for that, and uh, we'll we'll talk more about what they do 
uh, next weekend coming forward. But oh, by the way, Josh McCown, just to tip this off for the, for those of you that hate to hear anything good about Josh McCown, uh, you know he finished yesterday with 356, two touchdowns, no picks, 119 quarterback rating. He joins. Otto Graham, this is just going to infuriate some Browns fans. Josh McCown now joins Otto Graham, Brian Seip, and Brian Hoyer as the only quarterbacks in Browns history to throw for 300 yards in back-to-back games, which is actually amazing. You realize that Bernie Kosar never did that for as prolific as, as we think of Bernie. He never had back-to-back 300-yard games. That's crazy. Yeah, that is, and he's obviously the name that list. Yeah. So you think, wow. Uh, he, he never did that. That's uh, that is a surprise to me for sure. But Josh McCown on that list there, along with Brian Hoyer as well, by the way, Brian Hoyer, as we switch off, how about around the NFL? Brian Hoyer comes in and I think he played one quarter through for two fifty and a couple of touchdowns. And, and now the, the quarterback drama rages on down there in Houston, apparently. Yeah, they were down forty-two to nothing, uh, yes, Jerry, and, yes. and uh, that 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 Texas that Houston team that that uh, you know, if I'm not mistaken, you had them in the playoffs. Shut they're, up! They're, Shut they're, up! <laughs> they're one of three, and but you know, on the upside, Hoyer may have won his job back yesterday. I guess Mallet looked pretty bad, and Awful. that's a couple 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 bad games in a row for Mallet, and and maybe it's uh, they're finding out that his time has not yet come, and and uh, they're going to try to win football games, and they're going to do that with the veteran. What's sad is as you say that, I look over to the right, and it's hanging. It's still got the tags and everything on it because I never got a chance to do anything with it. Like last year, my mom uh, picked me up from, from GV Artwork a, a Hometown Hoyer T-shirt, and problem was is by the time she gave it to me, it was already clear as day that he wasn't coming back. <laughs> that, that he was going to be that's playing why the, that's, why the, that's why the tags are still on it. Huh? Right. I never even wore it. I'm like, well, I'm not going to wear it. I'm just going to hang it in the studio with all the other, you know, collector shirts and stuff. And it can go with the other 57 jerseys and stuff. But anyways, I'm looking at hometown Hoyer as you say that. Hey, did you catch up with well, that? I, I wish him well. Yeah, absolutely. Around the rest of the NFL, man, there was, uh, there was some interesting game. How about that Sunday night finish? Did you watch it? Yeah, oh, I did. Yeah, I was watching last night. Uh, great, uh, great game. And, and you know, Brandon Whedon, uh, it looked like for a while there he was going to resort to doing Brandon Whedon things. But uh, darn if he didn't uh, march him the length of the field, made a couple, two or three great throws, and uh, and got him the tying touchdown. And uh, so, yeah, he, he did his thing. And, and obviously uh, Saints took over and, and uh, scored early in overtime. But uh, – they they've talked about. I heard somebody. Well, I guess it was on your news talking about how they're they're happy with the job that Whedon's doing for them. And yeah, uh, you know, more more power to them. I, I don't know that. Uh, I was looking at uh, Jerry Jones on on camera late in that game when when uh, they were kind of letting it slip away and the Saints were going ahead going out to the lead. Uh, he didn't look real happy as far as what was going on with Brandon Whedon, but <laughs> Whedon Whedon he gave him that last drive at least and. Uh, put a temporary smile back on Jerry's face. Yeah, they're they're going to have to figure out how to just not fall out of it, they, you know, fall too deep of a hole before they get their guys back there, Romo and Des Bryant and and I still I'll tell you, that uh, that'll just show you how really injuries you can you can talk about you know the browns and making excuses but in real life injuries man can change the course of a season because i thought that dallas team and they still may do something special before it's done but look at how quickly two weeks in a row you can have the guts ripped out of your team by losing just a couple of key pieces the way they did yeah not only that but uh who would have who would have bet that the redskins and the cowboys would have the same record after four games how about the redskins uh, and, yesterday and, man and, and, yeah and the eagles of course uh you know are what one and three uh they were supposedly going to be the uh, the challengers to the cowboys so the, at least the cowboys can look around and say well you know the the eagles are uh, are one and three and and the giants Presumably, they played pretty well. They gave a game away early, but uh, they came back. They beat, you know, the Bills soundly yesterday. I mean, that was not even close. Uh, the Bills looked terrible on their home field. I watched a good portion of that game. Yeah, they um, did. And uh, that uh, the Giants look uh, look like the only only team in that division that's going to really give the Cowboys a run for their money. And uh, you know, that wasn't really expected. I don't think. 
it's a whole NFL. Like we say, you say it a lot, the, the week to week and, and what's up is down and what's left is right. You know, St. Louis and Arizona, St. Louis ends up winning that game, you know, and, and there's a team that's been every week. St. Louis has been like the Browns. They're up for one down for the next up for one down for the next so far through the, the early part of the season. And, and as you mentioned, some of these, some of these teams, Houston, who, you know, they're the bottom fall here, Oakland, you know, they're, they're looking like they're getting things going. Chicago's got the bottom falling out and then they win. You get their first win of the season. So uh, it really is unpredictable. Washington, by the way, man, that touchdown right at the end there, Kirk Cousins bringing them. Now everybody, everybody had Kirk Cousins high on the, uh, you know, high expectations list this season, but uh, crazy, man. Carolina undefeated. I mean, how about Indianapolis? No Andrew Luck, and they they get it to overtime. They survive. They That was a hard, ugly, ugly game there with Jacksonville, man. But no Andrew Luck, and, you know, they're able to keep it going. It was a good week of football. It's some interesting games for sure. Yeah, it was. A 40, you know, teams that, that were losing at home, certainly the 49ers, again, got just shellacked by the Packers. And, but the Cardinals yeah. losing at home, certainly to the Rams, was a surprise. The Vikings going into Denver – and taking that game down to the wire was right another big surprise it. for me. The yeah. Broncos, Broncos survived by a field goal, but that was surprising. The Vikings have been playing over their head. Um, and, um, you know, we, we forget uh, to pay a lot of attention to the the, uh, the juggernaut in Cincinnati. Uh, that's uh, that's 4-0. and They ended up uh, having a home game beat the Chiefs. So uh, that and the, and the, uh, the Panthers' 4-0 and start has to be a little bit of a surprise. But everybody else is sort of uh, – you know, doing what they're supposed to do. The fact that the Lions haven't won a game and they've got to play the Seahawks tonight, uh, that might be one of the bigger surprises. The Lions were uh, one of the sexy picks in the preseason to uh, to do well and go to the playoffs. So their 0-3 start has got to be uh, having people tearing their hair out up there. Yeah, for sure. What do you think about Cincinnati, man? You think they're legit? I mean, they're clearly a good start to the season for them. They're one of the handful of un- – what do you got? Cincinnati – New England, uh, who else? Carolina, are those the undefeated? It's in Denver, right? Is there anybody else? Right, because the, the Packers have a loss, are they not? Uh, yeah, no, the Packers they, oh, are no, Atlanta, too. Atlanta, Carolina. Yeah, Atlanta and Atlanta is also undefeated. How about them? They're starting to get. Hey, don't they have an offensive coordinator there that we've heard of before? I don't know. They may. <laughs> they may. Yeah, the yeah, Packers. They too. Yeah, the Packers they, are undefeated as well. They put up some. They put up some big time points here uh, in the last few weeks. Yeah, uh, Kyle Shanahan, is the Bengals, the offensive you know, coordinator the Bengals. There, yeah. You asked about. It. I uh, I think they're they're for real. I mean, they've had good talent on defense. Uh, they haven't really put it together, but their offense is is awesome. I mean, uh, they've got that two back thing now with uh, Bernard and the Hill. Uh, and those are two darn good running backs that both can catch the ball and. Yeah. Uh, Hill, I think, is uh, just emerging as a as a star quality type player. And, uh, you know, of course, the standard refrain, anytime you talk about the main, well, it's a regular season. Well, wait for the playoffs. They're always joking the playoffs. Well, you know, we'll see. But uh, you've got to get to the playoffs, and you've got to get home field advantage in the playoffs, and they're well on their way to uh, to doing those things. Absolutely. Dan Wismar joining us here. Everybody hates Cleveland, and we're talking about the Browns and the NFL. And while we're talking football, let's let's get into some Buckeyes here, man. And a tough one, a, a hard-fought one for the Buckeyes the other day as they kicked off Big Ten play. And uh, you and I talked about it a little bit, a, a strong performance. Third, Ezekiel Elliott, a career day in trouble. I, I was back and forth watching the game and uh, getting some stuff together for dinner in the kitchen, and my son's coming in and updating me on the game. Dad, Dad, Ohio State's losing. All right, relax. No, man, I'm telling you, it's not looking good. My son was tripping. I said, they'll, they'll pull it out. But then Indiana just kept with it. And what were you thinking watching that, that game the other day? Well, it was crazy. Uh, I, I, you could tell right away that the Buckeyes were just flattered in the pancake. I mean, they they were tight. Uh, they uh, it, it was like they're just fake. Um, it, you know, from fumbling the uh, balls that uh, that are, should be downed on the one yard line on a punt. You know, inexplicable stuff going on. You could tell right out of the gate that this was one of those days. And, and I'm thinking to myself, you know. Urban Meyer's going to lose a Big Ten regular season game sometime. He's in his fourth season. He's yet to lose one. It's going to happen. I believe that it's going to happen this year. I don't see how it can't happen the way the team has been, you know, just sort of uh, 
playing not to lose, afraid to make a mistake. They look very, very tight. They don't look relaxed. Uh, and they still haven't gotten the offensive thing uh, worked out. Yes, Ezekiel Elliott, you know, great player, bailed him out, had some had some great runs. Um, and they put up 34 points, but, boy, they, they had a hard time uh, shaking off the Hoosiers, and the Hoosiers played way better defense than, than they played against anybody this year. Um, and I, I honestly don't know whether that's just a function of, uh, of Ohio State not being in sync or, or whether, uh, you know, Indiana just played up to the occasion. I've got a feeling that, uh, that it was the latter, that they gave up 47 more points to Eastern Kentucky, and, and you figured the Buckeyes were going to, you know, ramble for and it just obviously didn't happen. Uh, Buckeyes actually, you know, trail them at the half, and, and it just uh, <laughs> this was a, a mess out there. I really don't know what the answer is. Uh, Elliott bailed them out with some big, big plays, but they do not have a, a very sophisticated passing game, downfield passing game. I was I was screaming, uh, Jerry, because right from the start, the, the Hoosiers' defense was daring the Buckeyes to throw the ball down the field, and we wouldn't do it. We were trying to just do what we do. We were trying to just run those running plays, the wide ones, the up the middle ones, and they were sitting there packing the box ready for it and, and literally begging the Buckeyes to throw the ball down the field. They finally did it, hit the tight end for a big completion, but they weren't going over the top much at all. And, and that was clearly what was called for. They finally did it once or twice, had some success with it, but, man, it just seemed like they're beating their heads against the wall because it feels so good when they stop or something. I, I don't know. Uh, it was it was not a well-conceived game plan, and uh, once again, the Buckeyes' defense bailed them out. After a couple of big plays early, that defense settled in and just really didn't give them much at all. So talk to me a bit, man. I mean – outside of just this game, the Buckeyes. And this is one of my things, and I think it, it trips me out, college football, and I've had these talks with people before, and it's weird how, okay, in the NFL, you don't go into the next season with everybody lined up based on the way they finished the season before, and you, you just say, hey, it's going to be the same. We're just going to start where we left off and, and then judge people based on where they ended last. You know what I mean? Every season starts from scratch. Yeah, football, because of the polls, has always had that that carryover effect, even though now it's not – you know, not as much with the with the committee and stuff, but still, uh, that's the the thing of it. Because, I mean, seriously, if you're if the Buckeyes are not the if you, if we're looking at this standalone standalone season, clearly the Buckeyes are not your number one team. Even though I'm not putting them way down either. I always thought that was funny because you're kind of living up to imaginary uh, expectations and and whatever. It's just. How the system works has always kind of made me chuckle because that's part of it here. But clearly, if if they weren't the defending champions, then they wouldn't they wouldn't be at number one based on the way they've played this season. No doubt, uh, they wouldn't. In fact, I saw one pundit this morning didn't have them in in, in the top ten. Uh, a couple of things. First of all, it's even less appropriate to base a college team, I mean, with a pro team, I mean, you know, the players Less are changes. essentially the same yeah. with some draft yeah. players. At least, right. you, you know, the Seahawks are going to be pretty good. You know, the Packers are going to be pretty good and the Patriots uh, are returning the same people. But right. college, kids graduate, freshmen come in, the coaches change. And, and I think they looked at the Buckeyes and they saw how they finished last year and they saw they had 15 starters back. Thinking, holy smokes, they've got starters, they've got three All-Americans on the first team. That You know, they're loaded, and they are. I think that the, the coaching change was the biggest single factor in, in what has happened. Um, and Tom Herman go to Houston and have them in the offense in, in new hands. Um, and, and really maybe, you know, losing a Michael Bennett on the defensive line has, has had an effect, but those things happen and you always have a good player to plug in there. I think the coaching difference is the biggest thing. But uh, the other thing too, Jerry, is, is polls. You can, People have always said, well, it doesn't really matter. You know, it's not how you start, it's how you finish. And the polls in October are meaningless. Well, if the polls in October have always been meaningless, they're even more meaningless now. Because right. the polls don't mean anything, even on the 1st of November. It's what the committee thinks. And, and uh, you know, the, the committee is going to look around on, on November with, you know, uh, eight and nine games under the belt of these teams. And, and uh, everybody will have a track record. And, 
what the AP or the coaches poll had to say in October is even more meaningless than ever uh, at this point in time. But you're, you're right. I think the Buckeyes right now, if I saw, I saw Herb Street uh, yesterday uh, listed Baylor as his number one team. I think he had the Buckeyes number two and he had Oklahoma at three. Uh, I also saw that it's the first time in five years that there is a top five without an SEC team in it. Uh, you know, there's LSU and Baylor, and some people have Michigan State in there, and and um, you, know, you had you had three sort of pretenders to the top five or top four, all lost. Number three, number six, and number seven. Actually, number eight, six, seven, and eight, all lost. Uh, and number three, Ole Miss lost, and then you had Notre Dame, UCLA, and Georgia, uh, six, seven, eight, all went south on Saturday. And so if you feel that the teams that are in the top five didn't deserve to be there, well, then you at least think that six, seven, and eight might be making a climb, and they couldn't do that because they all lost. So it's really a crapshoot now. But I don't know if you'd agree that the, the polls are, are meaningless today and maybe even more so than ever. I absolutely agree. Absolutely. Now I'm curious. What do you think about the uh... – I mean, and here we are getting deeper into a season where you don't start monkeying around with stuff. I mean, do you see any changes in the near future at the quarterback position with the Buckeyes, or do they continue to press forward with the with current range of, of, of attack? I think they'll probably stick with where they are. Um, <clears throat> Cardale, you know, made some mistakes, made some judgment mistakes, uh, lack touch on several throws. Let's remember he's a really still in his first full season of starting oh, yeah. at quarterback. Total freshman. Half uh, he, a season. You could yeah. it, it's it's fair to say that he he's still a green learner uh, trying to figure out how to play this position at the big time level. Uh, you know he's got a national championship under his belt that people tend to forget that uh, he's had eight. I think this will be nine starts this week. Uh, you know, five and zero oh, and three last year. So yeah, I'll be making only his ninth start of his career uh, this Saturday. So <laughs> it's uh, he's still a work in progress, and I, I guess he, they still think that uh, he's a guy who gives them the best shot, makes you know, make all the throws and stretch the field. Well, I'm just surprised that they haven't thrown the ball down the field more because it seems like that's what teams are daring him to do, and that's what uh, uh, you know they've got the talent to do it. They yeah, did lose Corey Smith for the do, season. Kind uh, of. You know? wide receiver, but uh, they've got so much talent at wide receiver. I guess they just simply don't trust those guys yet down the field, and Marshall had a nice catch, and then he turned around and fumbled the ball, so he had two fumbles on the day, and that's a real problem. He's one of their best weapons, and, and you can't put the ball on the ground twice in one game and, uh, and, and hope to overcome it against some of the better teams that they have coming up. I agree with you, you know, and especially it's like you said, with so much talent there off and, and, and sometimes that's it. I know this sounds crazy, but like um, uh, probably not the best example here in Cleveland. But remember, you know, when the heat super copped up together down there with LeBron and those guys and they had their their struggles at first. That was one of the things that they talked about was the the difficulty when you've got excesses of talent, figuring out how to make them all work together because they end up, you know, it's almost like. You know, when you hear about people that everything moves so fast and then they take a a medication that speeds them up, but it actually slows them down because they're already moving. You know, one of those kind of things. And I wonder if some of it isn't just that and being, you know, overthinking stuff too much. You got to we've talked about it. You got to feel that there's going to come an opening up point for this offense where you go. That's what we envisioned this offense to look like all along. Yeah, I, I wish that they would, you know, first of all, wish they would there, do it there, soon. Has been, there, has, <laughs> there, there has been kind of a fundamental change in the, the offensive philosophy, and it has to do with Ed Warner coming in as a coordinator, I'm sure. Yeah. That they said, uh, Meyer said the other day, a couple of weeks ago, uh, uh, the read option really isn't that big a part of our offense anymore. And my thought at the time was, why not? You know, you you won the national championship with it. You you won, you went eleven and one with JT Barrett running it. Uh, and uh, what you're trying to do right now isn't working effectively. Maybe you should go back to it. Uh, Cardale, not the most deft ball handler in the world or, or the the quickest guy, but uh, you know when he decides to call his own number on the read option, he's hard to bring down, and and he's proven that you know over and over. So. They, they really have gone away from read option, and they've also gone away from the a, a lot of spread pass the ball out to the perimeter. They ran a couple of plays out there to Jalen Marshall the other day, but 
They used to do that a lot more last year where the quarterback stands up and throws it out. Now they're running the ball, little jet sweeps, where the defense has a lot more time to adjust to it and react to it. If you're standing up and throwing the ball out there to the flat, uh, to, a, to a playmaker in space, you have a lot better chance of a big gain than if you're have, handing it to him and having him run out there. So I just I would like to see them go back to more of the style they ran last year because I don't think their their offense really resembles last year's offense, not just in the productivity, but in the actual play calling and, and scheme. I very much agree with you there. You know, I saw it. You probably saw it too in the Plain Dealer. They had the the funny little piece about how the Browns went and played there, and and you know left their left their Browns tradate uh, characteristics back with them at the uh, at the old shoe. There, it was a it was, there's a whole series of stats, and is it a Brown stat or is it a Buckeye stat? But but it points out we already know we talk about it all the time with the Browns, but a lot of the things that are hurting the Buckeyes, you know, like uh, Browns or Buckeyes, eight and a half penalties per game. Which one would you guess? Oh, I think, uh, you know, I would guess Brown certainly, but that's probably the Buckeyes. It is the Browns. They've racked up a lot of them, too. The Buckeyes are right under eight a game as well. They're 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 at the uh, the high end of that as well. Browns are uh, 25th out of 30. There's only seven teams worse than the Browns when it comes to that. And I think that's even leaving out yesterday's game and the dozen penalties that they added there. Two and a half turnovers a game. Browns or Buckeyes? Oh, that's probably Buckeyes. That's the Buckeyes as well. Yeah, thirteen turnovers so far in the uh, in the beginning part of the season, minus four. Yeah, and, and that really that that's really it. has always come with the comes with the territory with the offense that they run. Um, they had you know quite a few turnovers last year too, but uh, you're not going to you can overcome them against Indiana. You can't overcome them against uh, you know Michigan State, Penn State. Michigan's on a roll. They haven't given up a point in two weeks. And where Ohio State is, and this is where we saw it most the other day, the red zone. They're they're 121st in the nation in red zone scoring percentage. They've only got six touchdowns in 16 trips so far. I mean, and, and, and we saw that it really pointed out the other day. But the Browns, believe it or not, even worse than that, they are dead last in the NFL, scoring on only 27% of their red zone uh possession so there you go maybe we shouldn't co-mingle the browns and the buckeyes this 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 way man i don't know maybe that's what did it man well i'm not putting a lot of stock in that theory but uh, i know i know i know let the fear your theory is it i know i'm just kidding no no no. your theory is very good and i think you're you're really on to a lot of it there with it just how the the offense the changes and how this is just really they've gotten away from some of the some of the things that were really working and uh You've got to think that the coordinator switch and that the that that's all a function of that there and having a lot of talents. Like I said, I think sometimes it's figuring out a way to to put it all together and get it together. I think once they do, I think I don't think you'll get a point where they have a big game and then they go back to to struggling. I do think that once they get going, if they reach that point this season, I think that they'll open it up a bit from there. Yeah, and I also think that people forget. Uh, that this time last year, they didn't look all that good either. Nope. Uh, you know, this time last year, they were they, they were not a great football team. They, they were struggling to win some games. They, they you know, had some tight ball games. Uh, and uh, really put it together. I, you have to just trust in the fact that you've got one of the best coaches in football. He is very candid about the fact that they're not very good. They need to get better. And, and they did last year. They adjusted and uh, it certainly won't be because they don't have uh, the attention to detail or, or the awareness or that they're somehow complacent and think they're going to just roll. Uh, you know, trust Urban, and, uh, you know, they're 5-0, and oh, and that's really all that matters at this point. It, uh, certainly style points count, and, and even more in this day and age. But uh, I still think right if, if the committee had to make their decision right now, I think the Buckeyes would be in the top four, if not number one. Dan Wismar, everybody hates Cleveland, joining us here. We talk Browns, Buckeyes all around. Hey, the Cavaliers get started tonight. Well, kind of. They're playing against themselves, but they do get started even though, you know, it's not the whole squad here. What did you think over the weekend with, uh, you know, now it's a big hubaloo that LeBron James is putting his thumb down on the Cavs? I'm not going to lie. I do. It did bother me just a little bit only because it's like, hey, 
Just let that's just gonna put gas on a fire that's already burning plenty strong enough by itself. Um, but at the same time, and I'm not trying to you know pick at LeBron here, but you weren't on there exactly saying you know Tristan, we need you back for weeks, and then he was you know it's I'm just saying you know agendas afoot at the Circle K, my friend, and that's what makes this very interesting as it continues to to go on. But do you think it's a good thing or a bad thing that LeBron James is now kind of weighing in on it as well? Well, I must admit to you that I haven't been on top of all that. And, uh, you know, I really thought that uh, that Thompson was going to have a a last-minute signing. And my understanding, uh, Jerry, and correct me if I'm wrong, it could still happen, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. There's nothing nothing, nothing preventing him from signing a long-term deal uh, even now, right? But, yeah, no, absolutely. No, the only thing he cannot do now, he cannot sign – the qualifying offer that has expired unless, and this won't happen. No team has ever done this, but if the Cavs chose to allow him, he could accept it. But as I said, that, that doesn't happen. So he's given that up. Technically Tristan Thompson does not play for any team right now. He is a, he is a free agent. He, his rights belong to the Cavaliers. He cannot go play anywhere else. But technically, Tristan Thompson does not play for the Cavaliers anymore either, which is why at midnight the other day, they removed his face from the lobby. They removed his face from the elevators. They took his jerseys out of the team shop. And that that's where it, it, it's kind of now become a real a, a touchy situation because up until that point, it was, well, they're going to work something out. They're going to work something out. Now the line is drawn in the sand to where the team has removed his visage from all over the place and said, Hey, we're moving forward, whether you're with us or not. And now you're in, but right after that, the counter LeBron takes a picture with Tristan and puts it out there and says, get it done. And, and, you know, obviously in reference towards the Cavaliers. And that's where I say now this thing is looking to go to perhaps a different level because you, you know, it's coming. You're going to hear the talk of how does this affect LeBron? How does this affect LeBron going forward? Is he going to remember this? Is it, you get all this stuff that you have no business talking about with what the Cavs are trying to get done this season. Yeah, and it also seems a little bit uh, disingenuous when you know that they share an agent. Right. And if LeBron wanted to, if LeBron wanted to, quote unquote, get something done, he should have picked up the phone and talked to Rich Paul, uh, you yeah. know, a month ago. Or, or or whatever, or, or you know, the idea that uh, LeBron sitting there, uh, a hapless bystander who's now, you know, begging uh, the front office and, and Tristan to, you know, work something out. Well, you know, Rich Paul is a rich man because of LeBron James. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> you know, it, well, LeBron obviously has some influence with him. And right. he really wants to do something other than pull a PR stunt. And this seems to be a PR stunt, nothing more, nothing less. Um, you know, in fact, you could even say he'd be, he could be accused of working in league with uh, Tristan Thompson's right, agent, collusion. his own agent, that, that's just, to, uh, that's what to, I'm to saying. put public relations pressure on the organization. And, and that just seems, uh, uh, I don't want to say beneath LeBron, but I, do, I just think it seems uh, transparent and, uh, and not very sincere. And, and see, you just hit it on the head. I'm not in any way looking to go, oh, here's a reason I don't like LeBron James. That's what bothered me is exactly what you said. Because in, in the same amount of time that you picked up your phone and you went on Twitter, and I know you're trying to get your boy paid. I get that. But you could make two phone calls to get your boy paid. You can call the Cavs and say, hey, man, we got to get this thing done, guys. Let's try to make it happen. I just talked to Rich. He's he's coming back to the table. Then you call Paul and you say, hey, look, this is a good value right here. I'll make sure that, that in three years, Tristan's worth twice as much as he's worth now. Let's make this thing happen. Let's not get in the way of this thing. And it's done. Instead, you go publicly and you do that in a way that you're trying to put public pressure on the organization. I, again, I mentioned this two weeks ago. I totally dig Tristan's perspective of it. And that's why I thought that everybody found a happy medium here, but apparently not. And I can't lie. This is an, I saw somebody say this this morning. I don't know if I would agree, but I think I would because his teams in Miami were not stacked deep. This may be the deepest talent as far as talent one through 12, deepest team LeBron James has had 
in his NBA career is the squad, once everybody's obviously healthy and signed and playing, that LeBron will have had in his NBA career. This is not just... This is not just, hey, here's some guys to go play with LeBron. This is a, a deep team that's too deep at every position with a few extra bodies left over. And, you know, I think the Cavs are well within their rights, and I would not have a problem now that we've reached this point. They go forward, and it's like, hey, think about it, though. Anderson Verjao brought this up, and I didn't even remember this at the time. I didn't even remember 2007. He missed a month of the season because he was doing exactly what – Tristan's doing right now he sat at home until the first week of December when they finally got his contract worked out so you know but I I I do understand where the Cavs are too because to me as much as you've got a great personal future here financially that you're trying to protect this is a a very special opportunity that the Cavs have for all of these players say it and I mean this is a very deep team Will they win it? I don't know. But I guarantee you, you're not going to get many better shots at it. So, you know, I don't mind the Cavs playing hardball either here. I mean, pull it and say, hey, if you want to get in, get in. But LeBron doing that to me, with the, and I'm with you, collusion was what I thought when you say, you know, sharing the Yeah, it's a little LeBron. bit, it, you know, it's a little bit transparent. As, as if he's, you know, hoping that the majority of people out there don't yeah. know that they share an agent. You know, right. and obviously that, that's well well known. You're right about the depth of the team, Jerry, and I think it might be arguable to say that with or without Tristan Thompson, they're the deepest team he's Agreed. ever played on. Agreed. Uh, and uh, and if you want to be part of it, you know, a lot depends on Verjao's, uh, you know, durability, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, it may be the deepest team, you know, Tristan or no Tristan. Uh, and, and like you, I don't have a problem with the Cavs front office playing hardball because you could also call it playing smart ball. I mean, uh, they, they can't give max money away to a guy that they don't in their heart of hearts feel is a max player. Uh, Tristan Thompson, hard to blame him because his value may never be any higher than it is right now. In fact, you could say it probably won't ever be uh, higher than it is right now. Uh, because of all the exposure and, and good ink that he got during the playoffs last year. Um, and uh, so you can understand his position too, but I'm glad that the front office of the Cavs is made up of grownups who aren't going to succumb to that kind of pressure and, uh, you know, overpay uh, like, thing, uh, like I think Thompson is insisting that they do. I think the third, the, the, the monkey wrench, the thing that's hanging over all of this is LeBron because not because of what he thinks right now, today, sign Tristan, but and it, it puts Tristan in the driver's seat with this because he <laughs> will eventually be able to leverage this because the, in the back of the mind of Dan Gilbert, in the back of the mind of David Griffin is if this negotiation gets ugly, how does that affect LeBron James' future going forward? I don't think he's going anywhere again because of the big deal that was made about coming home, but that's a part of it, you know? Yeah, that's true. That could be. And, and I, I, I'm i a little surprised that even he's involving himself at this stage in it, and, and that's why Cause he stayed it, it out appears for a while. to be, yeah. it appears yeah. to be just a, a PR push and a, and a thing that hopes people don't see through how, how transparently uh, uh, you know, self-interested it is for, for him and his agent to be using LeBron's celebrity to, uh, to negotiate in public. Yeah, we'll see. We'll talk about it. Cavs scrimmage, they they get things run here. Preseason schedule's getting started, and, and they'll slowly start putting this together. Wednesday, you and I will circle the wagons back, and we'll we'll talk about the Browns. I guarantee you there'll be something to talk about. Ray Farmer's coming back. Who knows? Do you know what can happen in Cleveland in 24, 48 hours? Oh, my goodness, man. Oh, yeah, it's, it's crazy <laughs> to think about it. And we can also, we didn't get a chance to do it today, but we'll do a little... Uh, a little retrospective rehash of, uh, of the tribe season. Well, well exactly. I, talk I was going to say, how did you feel? I mean, playoffs. I, uh, I, I love three. the playoff lineups. Uh, I, I, I think that the National League is probably a little bit more compelling than the American, but I, I like the idea. I'm hoping like heck that Houston can beat the Yankees uh, tomorrow night and, and then uh, have that winner go to Kansas City. And uh, Texas-Toronto ought to be a real slugfest. Uh, a lot of the, a lot of people I've been hearing uh, think Toronto has a uh, has a capability of winning the whole thing. Um, although, I think certainly you'd have to say that the best two or three teams probably uh, are reside in the National League. 
But Dan, uh, how do, how do Toronto, you feel Toronto, about 97 and 98 wins in the wild card game? I mean, isn't that tragic? That, that uh, amazing. That, yeah. Yeah. People were trying to people were trying to figure out if, if the top three records in Major League Baseball have ever been in the same division. I can't recall it ever happening. I don't I think can't. it's ever happened. No, I can't uh, either. But that's 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 what we're faced with. And yeah, the idea that either the Pirates or the Cubs is going to be eliminated uh, in one game with their 97, 98 wins that uh, seems crazy. But uh, that's what's going on. And, and you know, the Pirates aren't relishing facing Jake Arrieta, uh, who, who one hit them uh, uh, what a week and a half ago. Uh, uh-huh. So yeah, that's uh, that's going to be something interesting to watch. But yeah. Can't wait for the baseball playoffs. I think it's going to be a great year. How about the Yankees without CC? Breaking news as we were talking. CC announces that he's checking himself into an alcohol rehab facility, and uh, there's something you don't want your one of your pitchers to announce here heading into the wild card game. My oh my, that is a that is a shocker. I had not heard that, Jerry. Oh yeah, that was breaking here just in the last since you and I started this conversation. Uh, that came out wow. from CC there. Wow. So. There's something we can that talk is, about on That Wednesday is big. I, I feel for him. Uh, I, I uh, you know, wish him well, I guess is all we can say. Uh, but, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a kick in the teeth, even though he's had a, a subpar season for him. For sure. Of course, CC going back in the, uh, in the day here in Cleveland. Indians, we'll talk more on Wednesday. But I, I'm with you. I give him two and an asterisk as far as winning seasons in this 500. But I consider it a win. Plain and simple, because they did dig back from what eleven games under was the was the low point of this season, somewhere around there, a dozen games under five hundred, something like that. They did dig themselves back out, but at the same time, man, that means that we're here. We are three straight, almost mirror-like seasons from each other. Bad start, strong finish. We're gonna get them next year. Optimism, bad start, strong finish. We're gonna get it. Here we go again. This is going to be a key off season. You've got the change at the top. You've got, I think you discovered a few more pieces maybe in this run than just some maybes. I think you really did find a few pieces for the future. But what are you thinking about? Uh, you know, this has got to be a truly key off season for the Indians here as far as whether they go up or down from here. Oh, no doubt. I, I think uh... – there, there's. It's not as though I think they are a couple bats away from being a very, very good team. Uh, I told you last. Yeah. Week I was very optimistic, you know, uh, toward the end of the season, and and whether they found their pieces uh, in, uh, you know, maybe a, you know, I noticed that both Bradley Zimmer and Clint Frazier are highly rated outfield prospects. They obviously need a couple people there. Uh, you've got to make some decisions. I, I don't think you can spin off Carlos Santana. And at this point, you're leading an RBI guy and you're leading home run hitter, even though he hit 234. Um, you don't have run producers uh, up and down that lineup like uh, like the, the truly successful teams in Major League Baseball have. So uh, you're a bat or two away from being a very, very good team and, and maybe a little bit of retooling in that bullpen as well. Uh, but, but this team is not far away from being very, very good. Yeah, we'll pick that up on Wednesday. But I, I referenced what you said at the beginning of the show as far as I feel a lot better about them, not just today than I did at the beginning of the season, but I think uh, at the end of the – and it's it's easy in hindsight to say that now because I felt good coming into this season from where they were. And, I mean, again, so much of it's going to depend on what they do here in the off season to add those couple pieces. But I do. I feel good. Uh, about the pitching in general we already knew about but we saw how the left side of that infield is going to look here in the future not just next year but going forward i think we we've seen some bright spots in the outfield and you know I, i'm into i don't little thing lonnie chisenhall i don't know that i'm sitting here excited to see him come back but i guess at least i'm more excited to see him in the outfield than i was at third base you know some some things yeah exactly like that. and whether he's your starting right fielder you know who, who knows but uh, you, you, you've got something out of Almonte. You've got something right. out of Chisholm Hall. You, you, you know, even uh, you know, a guy like Jesus Aguilar. You know, maybe he helps your team next year. Maybe he doesn't. But you're right. It's a big off season to try to fill a couple of slots uh, on the uh, you know the 15 everyday player roster, and uh, and maybe a bullpen slot or two. Um, but yeah, I think the team is close. So you know, Sports Illustrated thought they were close this year. A lot of us yeah. thought they were close this year and they stumbled out of the gate. But they, they definitely learned how to win games uh, down on the stretch, and, and they uncovered a bona fide star in, in uh, Frankie Lindor. And, uh, 
to me, the biggest development of the second half is is Josh Tomlin, Cody Anderson. They combined to go 14 and five on a team that played 500 ball for the whole year. Yeah. Uh, arguably, your fifth and sixth starting pitching prospects, if you count, if you leave Bauer in the rotation, um, that is strong to get that kind of performance from guys that are legitimately five and six uh, starters for you. Uh, to have them go seven and two and seven and three, both with an ERA of three point zero something, and uh, that's just out of the blue, outstanding pitching that you didn't expect, and really bodes well going into the next year. For sure, came out of nowhere. I agree with you, Charles. That was a, a good find there. And what was that stat? We'll, we'll talk more on Wednesday. But what were the Indians? Was it like ten and and twenty something in Kluber starts? It was an awful number. Their win season in general, and. Uh, that that's the one that stuck out. You know, we talked about him, you know, having the way it went, but yeah. But then you bounce that off with guys like Anderson. In there. That's right. Josh Tomlin did recover himself there, and and I I've always liked Josh Tomlin. The Cowboys have been one of my favorites. He let me down uh, a year ago, but he's bounced back here, and I'm I'm looking I'm looking to see what they add to it. Let's do it Wednesday. We'll talk a little tribe, talk some Cavs. We'll talk Browns preview, the Ravens, Buckeyes preview, the. Maryland game coming up and all that on Wednesday. Sounds great, Jerry. Always good to be with you. Always good, my man. Dan, you have a good one. We'll catch up in a few days. That's Dan the Man Wismar from EverybodyHatesCleveland.com. Make sure you check him out. And, of course, you can tweet with Dan at DWismar on Twitter. And he's here Mondays and Wednesdays on the Sports Fix. Let's take a break. Oh, man, I got to. Yeah, catch my breath there, too. Take a break. We'll come back. We'll talk about the Indians. They swept the Red Sox, wrapped up the weekend. Cavaliers scrimmage here. We'll get you all set for the uh, for the remainder of the next few days and more. Don't go anywhere. Final say. Hey, phones are open. 216-539-7535 as well. 216-539-7535. We'll be back wrapping things up next here on the Sports Fix. The Sports Fix is now available every day on the world's largest internet radio service, iHeartRadio. Download the free iHeartRadio app, subscribe to the show, and get your fix. Football season is party season at Harry Buffalo North Olmstead. And no matter who you root for, everyone wins at Harry Buffalo. Every Saturday is Coors Light College Football Saturday with six dollar pitchers, four bottles for ten bucks, and the Buckeyes in full HD. Every Sunday, all the Browns action with Bud Light beer specials and ten dollar hair of the dog pitchers. Plus, every Monday night, catch the Monday Night Football action with some of your favorite Browns players. Football season is most definitely party season, and your headquarters is Harry Buffalo, North Olmstead, all winter long. Harry Buffalo, join the herd. Fantasy sports lovers, you put so much time, hard work, and effort into playing week to week that it quickly stops being a fantasy and And starts starts getting getting real. Real Real time spent making real decisions, creating real victory. I'm the greatest man in the world! And when the smoke clears, you want to show off those victories with a real prize. I mean, a really real prize. Nobody Nobody does does that that like like Fantasy Fantasy Jocks. Jocks. The crew over at Fantasy Jocks have beautiful, high-quality, and heavy-duty championship belts, rings, trophies, and so much more for all your fantasy sports needs. The trophy's 12 feet high, and it is glorious! Football, baseball, hoops, you name it, they have it. Plus, they have awesome draft kits and party supplies to make all your preseason activities the envy of everyone. If your league needs a ring, belt, or trophy, or you want to upgrade what you already have, there's literally only one place to go. If you're going to be a fantasy jock, do it right. It's mine. The most magnificent belt ever created. And it's mine. With America's fantasy sports superstore, fantasyjocks.com. It can happen when a team works together. Two out, bottom of the ninth, down to their left. Fight against cancer. 
That's why MLB has teamed up with Stand Up to Cancer. Because we believe that when we all stand up together, 41,000 on their feet, we can make cancer history. Now everybody's standing. What a buzz in this building. This is beyond a dream. Stand up with MLB at StandUpToCancer.org. Portions of the Sports Fix brought to you by Fantasy Jocks. Visit FantasyJocks.com, your fantasy sports superstore. Championship belts, rings, trophies, and more. This is the Sports Fix. What is your name? I'm the dude. So that's what you call me, you know? Uh, that or uh, his dudeness or uh, duder or, uh, you know, El Duderino if you're not into the whole brevity thing. Dude, what do you want? Uh, well, it's uh, this rug I have. It really tied the room together. Uh, we are not a show to be swept under the rug. We are a show to be heard. He's the Sports, Sports Fix. Fix. Welcome back to the Sports Fix Live. J-Rock back with you here as we get into the final portion of the show. 216-539-7535. Facebook.com slash the Sports Fix. Twitter at the Sports Fix CLE. And, you know, we were talking before the break with Dan Wismar. Thanks to Dan again for joining us. And he'll be back on Wednesday when we were talking Tristan Thompson here heading uh, heading into the break. And, of course, the Cavaliers wine and gold scrimmage tonight at the Q, 7 p.m. First look at the Cavs on the floor and we were talking about LeBron speaking up, and, and LeBron spoke to the media this morning uh, a little bit and said that he was speaking both to Tristan and to the Cavaliers. I say, man, why are you speaking to anybody on social media? That's that passive-aggressive, that's that, that's that girl stuff. That, you know when you, you've got that girl who, you know, or that that that, that uh, friend who's maybe not, uh, not, not interested in a face-to-face conversation, so they'll like passive aggressively tweet or post on Facebook and they'll like subtweet. It'll be about something, but they're all vague and they don't tell you what it's about. But you know, anyways, they're talking about something specifically, but they don't, that's that passive aggressiveness. Same thing here. You are LeBron freaking James. You pick up your phone. You talk to Dan Gilbert. You talk to David Griffin. You talk to Rich Paul. You talk to Tristan Thompson and you say, now listen, Y'all sit down and make this thing happen. You want too much money. You don't want to pay him enough money. Let's make this thing happen, man. We're trying to win some championships here. Don't don't go do it on Twitter. Just go do it in real life. Instead of tweeting, get it done, text Tristan and text David Griffin and go get it done. And they'll know that LeBron wants them to get it done. There's no reason to go put it out there in social media. Because all that's going to do is make the retarded half of the media, and I don't mean that. I don't. You guys know I don't like to use that word uh in in many contexts they make the the less intelligent half of the media go nuts and just create a story that doesn't need to be there so let's let's just avoid that let's let's just avoid that lebron come on hook your boy up uh one thing though that we didn't talk about with dan the the kind of flip side is that you know tristan thompson's leverage is pretty limited in this situation if he doesn't want to sit out an entire season because there are only two. Now, next summer, there's going to be a lot of teams with salary cap money. Right now, there are two teams. Actually, no. I believe there's only one. LeBron was saying two. I believe that only Portland has the salary cap room to even sign Tristan to an offer sheet. And really, that may be what it takes to get this done. But other than Portland and perhaps the Philadelphia 76ers, those are the only two teams that can... Because that's the stage that we're at. The only way that Tristan has any leverage is to sign an offer with another team. Bring it back to the Cavs, and then the Cavs match it, and then we're done. This whole little dance is over with. Unfortunately, the only... I mean, now, hey, LeBron's got people at Nike out in the Portland area. Maybe make some phone calls and say, hey, psst, hey can I get a LeBron favor here? I'm just saying, man. 
can y'all make an offer to my bro? I'm just kidding. But really, until Portland puts an offer on paper, or perhaps Philly puts an offer on, that's the only leverage that Tristan will be able to take back to the Cavs. And again, maybe that gets it done, because then it's done in 72 hours. Offer, signed, matched, contract, physical, let's get started with the season. That may be what it takes. But it's if it was summer, it'd be way different, because you'd have all kinds of other teams out there with the leverage to sign a contract and then he bring and, and what's crazy is that this is really just a function of money because Tristan's not going anywhere else. The Cavs, what I mean by that is there is no number that another team is going to sign him to that the Cavs won't match, which is why I think this whole game is kind of silly to begin with because the minute he does get another offer, the Cavs are just going to match it. The Cavs are betting that he's not going to get an offer better than the one that they've got on the table. And I just cannot see Tristan Thompson being willing to sit out a whole season with his limited bargaining position and then, and then, and then try to cash. I I just, I can't see it. Plus you do that. You now have to function in the amount of money that you missed by sitting out a season into your new contract. So you're now not making as much money as you thought because you went one whole season without getting paid. And so you have to recoup that money that you didn't make. It all adds up to they need to get something and should get something figured out quickly. The more these parties all realize that, you would think it would all fall together. But that was kind of just another uh, a little chip in the board there that we didn't talk about. We'll get into it some more with Dan here. And again, the, the scrimmages tonight, those of you guys heading down there, we'd love to hear from you, and then they'll get started with the with the preseason schedule. Indians would have played game 162 today if it mattered, but it doesn't, so they don't. They're only going to play 161. They finish 81-80, and 80, swept the Red Sox over the weekend, as I mentioned. They'll 360 around yeah, just a share, sh- what, shy of six months from now. And do it again. Same teams, same place. They'll start the season. So a lot, lot of things happen between now and then, and to see where we end up when we start this next season. But uh, word out of Boston is that Farrell's going to go back or come back, and uh, as the manager again. By the way, breaking this morning, a couple of people not coming back as managers and coaches. Matt Williams out in Washington for the Nationals. Joe Philbin out after just four weeks here. A lot of expectations with the Dolphins. They've spent some money. They've drafted some players. They got the $100 million Domicon Sue, who, by the way, did that man really kick another player's helmet off on accident? He is he is the master of the accidental helmet kick there, but uh, he's definitely not paying off in that. that that's the Albert Hainsworth ju- Jr. right there. If you remember the, the Albert Hainsworth deal when he signed, that that's what that is right there. He was going to town for the Titans and then signed at... Uh, that contract with the skins and it was uh, yeah that's what this is right here Domicon's just the next uh Hainsworth but all of that adds up to some short uh some short tempers there for sure <laughs> absolutely down there in uh in Miami Philbin's out makes you wonder uh if the hot seat is that hot here in Cleveland just yet it'll be interesting what Ray Farmer's got to say when uh, when he gets back out there. Monday night football tonight, final game of the week, Detroit, Seattle. Should be a good one here. Seattle looking to get back to 500. Detroit still looking for that first win of the season. They're 0-3. I don't think they're going to get it tonight going on the road to Seattle. But then again, this, this league is always giving you the exact opposite of what you expect. And uh, so who knows? Knowing that, maybe Calvin Johnson goes and has one of them Megatron days. What is this? that I'm looking at here is I'm getting ready to take the last phone call of the day uh, popped up on my news feed here. It's like teams getting ready for the playoffs. Uh, <laughs> have you guys seen this one? Maybe not. I don't even know where this came from here. The Texas Rangers have bounced out some new food for the play. This thing is disgusting looking, I guess in a, in a good way for those of you that get into, this is a $26 brownie it's the elvis jabber dog brownie what the hell is this thing it's two feet long it's a brownie that's rolled in rice krispies they 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 crush rice krispies they roll the brownie in rice krispies dip it in funnel cake batter and then drop it into the deep fryer 
It's $26. It is named after Elvis Andrus, the shortstop there. Again, it's a two-foot-long chocolate brownie rolled in crushed Rice Krispies, then dipped in funnel cake batter and dropped into the deep fryer. Wow. That's uh, that's something right there. That's that, that's I'm looking at it. It just looks. I I would I think I think that I literally am putting on weight just looking at this thing here, man. And maybe I'll pull the ultimate. Well, you know what? The, the ultimate warrior, the wrestler who passed away. Uh, funny stories about how strict he was with his diet is uh, he wouldn't allow himself to eat sweets. So his trick was he would take uh, like cookies or brownies or whatever it is. He'd get it in his hand. He'd crush it up and, and, and then smell it. I know this sounds crazy. He would he would smell it. He'd throw the food away after he was done. He'd crush it, smell it. And somehow the aroma was good. At, like that was that was as close as he would he would get to eating it. And then he would toss the actual uh cookie away no uh, no truth to the rumor that you know uh, guys like me yeah I, I'm, I'm just saying back in the day and i follow him behind and go hey i'll finish them cookies for you but uh that's what i feel like doing with this thing right here maybe i can just inhale the aroma even then i think i'd put on five pounds that thing is massive some of the things they invent at these stadiums for people to eat are just just whopping and this is it for sure that's a that's a, that's a deep fried chocolate heart attack right there. More power to you. Twenty six dollars too. Your whole section would split that probably, man. That'd be a, everybody chip in two dollars, man. We're going tw- we're going thirteen deep on this thing. Caller, finish it up. Take us home on the sports fix. Jerak Daddy, that sounds disgusting to me. Ah, I was afraid you were gonna say delicious. If it looks, hey man, it. It looks like if that's your thing, then that that's something. But man, I mean, I just I'm like, boy, man, the brownie, a two foot long brownie enough is uh, that's a lot of chocolate. That's a lot of brownie right there. Let alone we're going to the but next level it with man. all that batter and everything else. That and the rice right, krispies. That's, that's a heart know? attack in the making, brother. I'm telling you, I would put on weight just smelling them cooking that thing. But anyways, man, it's. Kind of like the 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 weight you put on watching the Browns do things like they did yesterday. Hey, listen, I hope we're not about to beat that over the head again because we're at the end of the show, and I'm just now seeing light at the end of the tunnel. So hopefully we're not going to just talk about how miserable we all were yesterday. LG, it was well, a terrible. Well, you know what, you're loss. Right, Daddy, I'm not that miserable at all because I'm going to put it to you right up out front. Uh oh. I tell you Uh-oh. what, the Browns played one heck of a football game yesterday, and. I had no expectations whatsoever of the Cleveland Browns going out there and playing and winning against the San Diego Chargers. Now, with that being said, they played a very competitive football game. That's 100% better than I thought they were going to do. Now, people don't remember this, but Phillip Rivers is a five-time pro bowler, buddy. I know. We talked about this, this guy, I know. This guy is the Ben Roethlisberger of the West Coast. And when Petten talks about how hard it is to bring him down, sure, they're playing with a banged-up offensive line. But you know what? You could hit the hell out of this guy. He's a big dude. He keeps coming at you, man. He's like one of them wrestlers. You just can't pin him. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, this guy's not some schlock quarterback i think i think that philip rivers is very underrated i think he just happened to fall into the san diego chargers lap at a time that the san diego chargers maybe didn't have the talent that the san diego chargers had when a guy like dan fouts was there you know what i'm talking about no i hear you but i mean it doesn't matter i I agree with what you're saying on one side of the ball but and not on the other side of the ball. I don't believe that the well, Browns really well, can do anything defensively. Well, and I say well again. We're going back to Mike Patton, who was supposed to be a defensive I know. head coach. I know. And I told you a couple weeks ago, after the first game of the season, and then we saw what a defense could show up like in the second game of the season. This goes back to... He's not a motivator of men because you got to be able to motivate those men. Look, J-Rock, when you climb in that squared circle and you do your business, 
and you and, and, and you, you got to motivate yourself. Am I wrong? No, no, no. In you general, yeah, in I know where you're coming God. from with that. You can't man. go in there and not keep your guard up. You can't go in there and not be ready to do what it is that J. Rod Daddy does, right? Oh no, I agree with you. I absolutely then agree with you. How the heck can you say to me that this Browns defense was ready to go out to the West Coast? Now you're on somebody else's turf. We all know how hard it is to win on somebody else's turf. The last thing a football team wants to do is let a team visiting come in and dominate them in a football game. But you got to be up for that. you got to be ready. And that's where the problem lies in the motivation of men, J-Rock, Daddy. Because the talent is there. If the talent wasn't there, we wouldn't have seen the exhibition we saw against uh, Mar- Marcus Mariota in the, in the quarterback hits. Uh, I heard you talking earlier in the show. The Browns, again, only had uh, this this week four quarterback hits, J. Rod Daddy, and two sacks, okay? I know. Four quarterback hits and two sacks. And then I heard Dan talking about where's Mingo, you know, where's this guy, where's Cougar. If you remember, when Patton came to Cleveland, some of his defensive schemes is don't go there, you run in your zone and don't leave that area, you know. So he's got to, you know, when he talks we're playing aggressive football, he must be playing on our computer after the game's over at home or something because we're not well, seeing Here's that. the thing. We're not and, seeing and you got to chalk some of this up to talent, too, because I go back to Mike Patton's defenses the two years before he came here. Um, what they were great at was sacks and turnovers. Got tons of sacks, tons of turnovers. What they were miserable at was stopping the run. They were 28th and 32nd, and then the Browns were 32nd again last year, and they're 32nd again this year. So four years in a row. Well, in total, Mike defense, defense, yeah. in total defense right now, we're rated 32nd. Which, which is amazing is because they're killing us on both sides right now. But, I mean, well, that's the thing. Not, Mike Patton's defense is in Buffalo. If you're a Browns fan. Hey, we don't have Kiko Alonso. We don't have Mario Williams. We don't have Darius. We don't have these guys. I'm just saying. Well, I the, do uh, like. Buffalo was a, a, phenomenal, a phenomenal football team, j Rock Daddy. Right, no, that's but, what I mean. On, We're missing you know, the linebackers, you know this, bro. You know this, uh, that is what you know this, this defense is missing. Defense is better than what we're seeing right now. now and I don't no, know why. I disagree on the linebacker side. I, I, I don't care how many decent mid-round draft picks we pile up that can make clean tackles. That's great. They can stop the run when they tackle them, but they can't stop the run. They can just tackle them 10 yards down after they get another first down. My point is, is there is well, not that's, that's... a linebacker. We do not have any aggressive. That's that I think is the key. The two pieces that that defense is missing. They've got great heart. They've got, they've got great pieces that will make a good defense. They don't have the true six, two shutdown corner. Okay. They don't have the linebacker that is the Khalil Mack or the Kiko Alonso type of aggressive getting in the backfield on every single play. They thought they figured that out with with Kruger last year, but then they moved him to the other side, and now he's not getting anything done. So I don't know. I don't know what who you blame that for. Okay, but well let's. I know you're under the gun here, and I just want yes. to bring up a point that I have not Go ahead, heard. And then we can talk about this anybody, Wednesday. Anybody bring up on your show today? What do you got? And it kind of it kind of breaks my heart a little bit because Uh-oh. Sam Rattigliano is being quoted as saying now that it's time to play Johnny Manziel. Now, what what's wrong with Sam that he thinks? I mean, like you said, I agree with you wholeheartedly, J. Rod Daddy, that you got a lot more than you intended to get out of this McCowan. I mean. Over the last two weeks, he threw 90 passes. If Johnny Manziel tried to throw 90 passes, his arm would have to be in a sling. That's number one. People don't realize how hard uh, this guy's elbow is hurting him, man. Uh, he has to miss practices, J-Rock Daddy, to rest his elbow. So these, even even a guy like Coach Sam, uh, I'm not I'm not so sure that Coach Sam realizes the extent of uh, of Johnny Manziel's eight elbow because when you got to pull a guy out of practice and have him rest two two to three days a week 
because his elbow is killing him. And when we saw him in a football game, J-Rock, he only threw 15 passes in the entire game. Now, this kid here is McCowan, 90 attempts in the last two weeks, 45 attempts per average, which we know 41 in one game, 49 in the other game. You know what I mean? Right. I if Johnny Manziel threw that kind of pass total, and another thing, uh, we got four touchdowns compared to one interception. I mean, come on, 90 passing attempts with one INT. We haven't seen that out of a Cleveland quarterback in a long time, J. Rock Daddy. I mean, Hoyer had a pretty good string going. I don't know. Well, here's I don't the know thing, if he only had... and and we can pick this up again on Wednesday. But I, here's the thing: I understand the Manziel argument from the perspective of this, and this is where we got to leave it for now. If you believe that the Browns are still hoping that Johnny Manziel will be their quarterback in the future, then I do understand your argument for starting him every single game the rest of the way because it doesn't matter if you win two games or four games or five games. You got to find out if the kid can play. My point is the longer that the Browns wait, the more it tells me that they don't have any intention of him being their quarterback of the future. They're just hoping that he can be an adequate backup quarterback. If they thought that he was going to be the quarterback of the future, he'd be the quarterback right now and he'd be getting that experience losing his way through the season they already know how far he had to come from the bottom just to be able to show up every day at practice and read the playbook and do what he needs to do i don't think that any of those quarterbacks either one of them is in the plans for the future i believe that austin davis is more in their plans for the future than either quarterback that they have that well, being said wasn't it you? the browns wasn't it just you there's a reason that- well, larry hang on there's a reason J-Rock. that the Browns aren't playing Johnny Manziel. Plain and simple. If you can't set yourself to figure that out, then you're just going to be mad at the Browns all the time. There's a reason that that kid is not playing football. And if you think that he's the reason that they're not winning games, then, hey, good luck to you because that ain't it. There's a reason that the kid's not playing no, no, football. No, no, no. That, that got nothing to do with why we're not winning football games. Like I texted you late last night. But it's not about winning. It's about developing next have, year. And unless they I had a package that. for Manziel to do something special on defense, they weren't going to make no difference exactly. putting Manziel in the exactly. game. But he wasn't it you defense. last week talking on one of your shows about the possibility, especially after the uh, Davis extension and giving them more money and all that, of uh, trading Manziel maybe to the Dallas Cowboys, j Rock. Well, no, that was just a possibility, but I do think that he may he may be on his way. You know, I'm just saying, I don't know that he... But here's again. the thing, here's the thing. After after Jerry Jones saw uh, what happened with Brandon Whedon last night, he went from being the most gifted passer that those old eyes that Jerry Jones uh, has in his head to just being an adequate quarterback who uh, is very Larry, limited. That's, Larry, that's let, me, new... let me wrap it up with this. Here's I Because I, I got to go. Here's where I'm going to end it with this. If you're Mike Pettin, here's your decision. You're going to lose 12 games this year no matter what. To me, you've got a better chance of keeping your job if you lose a bunch of 30 to 27 games where your offense doesn't look like a scout team. You got a better chance than losing a bunch of 30 to 7 games where your offense looks like a Bush League offense and you're quote unquote developing somebody else's quarterback because you ain't going to be here next year to teach him and that's part of the problem if the Browns decide today if Ray Farmer shows up to work and says I want to develop Johnny Manziel then your expectations of your coach change and you you tell him it's all good we're not going to fire you if you lose 12 in a row sweet I'm going to throw the kid out there, and we're going to lose 12 in a row as long as I know I'm not going to lose my job. But if I if my job's on the line, I would rather – I know 4-12 and 12 is 4-12. and 12, I But I'd rather, think, I'd rather I lose like 12, I, I 30, 27 games. In the front office it doesn't matter. Larry, I got to go, man. Hey, Larry, I got I to gotta go. I got to wrap this thing up, man. We can talk more about it on Wednesday. All right, but like I said, I think they're all on the same page. Otherwise, Manziel would have been named a starter, man. Agreed. Uh, I'm with you there. I think the only person that's not on the same page is the fan base that thinks that they've got some 
magic man laying in the weeds or and like whatever. I said, I'm just a little bit concerned if Sam's losing his better senses too. He's not. His point is right. If you think Johnny Manziel is your quarterback next year, he should be playing right now. I agree with that. If you think he's your quarterback next year, he should be playing right now. Absolutely. I don't think he's your quarterback next year, and I don't think Mike Pettin thinks he's your quarterback next year, and that's why he's not playing right now. It has nothing to do with Josh McCown. It has nothing to do with winning football games. It's that they don't think Josh or Johnny Manziel is the future anymore. Maybe you think that's stupid. If you're a Johnny Manziel fan, maybe you think the Browns are stupid, and maybe that kid will go somewhere else and prove you wrong. I don't think so. Well, here's think, the whole thing. Let me but sum it up, and Larry, I'm going to let you go, it. Jack. Let me just they sum this up. They don't think he's the future. If we he's the future, he's We don't have the inside preview to everything that they have. I'm just if telling you. If we did, we would have known, right. known McCown could come out and play some football. It I has mean, nothing to do with shot. McCown, Larry. It has nothing to do with McCown. No, no, I'm just saying, listen to the point. Listen to the point. I'm just saying, if we had the inside preview of what the Browns coaching staff and everybody else has, we would know their reasons for what Manziel's limitations are. And maybe, maybe they don't think he's the future. Cause I'm saying they thought McCowan could win some football games. They thought this guy could play some football. None of us were sold on him. Now after throwing 697 yards in two games, four touchdowns, only one interception. If we only had the same show up every percent of that, percent every game, you gave us, and we do Larry, ball games with 300 and passing. I, for those of you guys. Right, bro, brother, you those, have a good day. I'll talk to you soon, all right? All right, man. For those of you that are Johnny Manziel fans, because Larry's fighting with me here on on something that I, I do agree with Coach Sam. I agree with all of you fans out there who think that you should be developing the future if he's on your roster. If the Browns believe that Johnny Menzel is part of their future, he should be playing right now. The fact that he's not playing tells you everything you need to know about what the Browns think about Johnny Manziel. Maybe that's very wrong. Maybe that's very right. That's a, a matter of proving itself over the next few years. My point is, it's not Johnny versus McCown. It's not anything like that. It's Manziel versus the future. If the Browns truly believe that he was their future, he would be playing right now. Mark my words. Mark my words. He'd be playing right now. He would have never went back to the bench after he won game number two. Any bad team would have used that point right there to go, boom, McCown's on the bench. We're paying him. He can sit there and mentor Johnny. It's time to see what the kids got. The fact that Manziel's not playing speaks volumes about Manziel. It has nothing to do with veteran journeyman Josh McCown. You know what I'm saying? That's my point. I like what we've gotten out of Josh McCown. Plain and simple, he's a bridge quarterback. One, two years. It could be McCown. It could be Hoyer. It could be any of those type of guys who get you through a couple of mediocre seasons. That's okay. That's good. That's what you wanted out of Josh McCown. My point is that Manziel and McCown is not the battle. People keep going, well, the hell, Manziel or McCown's not the future. We need to be playing the future. You just answered your own question. If you want to know why Johnny Manziel's not playing, it's because they don't consider him the future. And if they did, he'd be playing right now. That's the problem. If you got a problem with that, then the Browns is your problem. It's not Josh McCown. Josh McCown has very adequately filled in at quarterback for the Browns and given you more than what you hoped for when you signed him. The problem is not the quarterback position. The problem is everywhere else. And I do believe it could be worse. Guys, we're going to wrap it up. Great phone call, Larry. Good segment. Dan joined us for a big, long conversation. You guys, keep the conversation rolling in, and we'll be back here Wednesday noon live. Same bad time, same bad channel across the Sports Fix Radio Network. We love you, Cleveland and beyond, and we will see you Wednesday. Have some fun. Enjoy the baseball playoffs that get started here Monday night football and more. Cavs scrimmage. We'll see you Wednesday. Talk about it all live. Dr. Football in the house. Dan Wismar and so much more Wednesday, baby. Right back 
here on the Sports Fix. The corridor and all the flat. You know that I'm a tribe spin and I love slime in. Crockett Park's the perfect place for me to spend some time in. Baby, this is Cleveland. It is so much more to us. You can even go to Severance Hall to see an orchestra. In So much hate up in this city, bitty city. If you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. Put your hands up in the air, everybody say yeah, yeah, yeah. 